Please be seated. Good afternoon. Let me remind you that today's meeting will be webcast for live or subsequent broadcast via the link on the agenda. So members, you are reminded that the recording of the webcast will be kept indefinitely. Members of the press or public may record and take photographs except where there are confidential or exempt items. May I also remind members that they do not enjoy parliamentary privilege in relation to debate in this chamber. And members should be careful in what they say during all debates this afternoon. May I also remind members that if they have mobile phones, turn them on to silent please. We have a list of speakers. Those wishing to speak should make their way to the lectern when I invite you to speak. Finally, may I remind members to wear masks at all times except when speaking. Also, could members please wipe down the lectern after you, leave, uh, after you have made your speech. Thank you. Finally, I would remind members that they must declare all relevant pecuniary and non-pecuniary interests relating to any items of business to be discussed at this meeting. Does, anybody, does anyone have any interest to declare? No, none. Thank you. I move that the minutes of the meeting held on 14th September 2021 have been circulated to each member of the council, be taken as read and confirmed as signed. Is that seconded? Is that agreed? Thank you. My next item is the third one. Death of former council, Henri Elderman and Drew Hubbard. I am sorry to say that my announcements today are sad ones, as I must inform the meeting of the deaths of some of our former colleagues. Firstly, it is with deep sorrow 
that I announce the death of former councillor, Honorary Elderman Andrew Howell, known to us all as Andy, who passed away on 6th October following a short illness. Andy served as a councillor from May 91 to May 2003. He served as deputy leader of the council from 1999 to 2003 and became an honorary elder man in May 2003. Andy leaves behind his wife Kate and son Kiran. I know you will join me in extending to them our deepest condolences. I move that this council places on record its sorrow at the death of former council, honorary elder man, Andrew Howell, and its appreciation of his devoted service to the residents of Birmingham. The council extends its deepest sympathy to members of Andy's family in their sad bereavement. Would member and officer please stand for one minute silence. Please be seated. I will now call upon councillors to pay tributes to honorary the gentleman, Andy Howell. First, Councillor Carl Rice. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I knew Andy from several different perspectives. He was first and foremost a, a valued Labour Party comrade, but both of us also worked for many years in the voluntary sector, and we both have a passion for hill walking, and uh, we walked the hills many times together. As has been said, Andy was elected for Mosley in 1991 and quickly established himself as a capable, trustworthy and principled councillor. And he was one of four 30-something Labour councillors who became committee chairs in 1993, along with myself, Jane Slowey, and Steve McCabe. So just two years after being elected, he was a, chaired one of the major committees of the council. And as chair of that committee, he set about transforming what was, at that time, a failing service, and brought out the very best from officers, councillors, and, most importantly, school staff. This meant for Birmingham's children ever improved outcomes, faster every year than elsewhere in the country. Um, and Tim Brighouse, uh, Birmingham's former Chief Education Officer, has got in touch with me and asked me to, to read a few words that he wanted um, said today. Andy became chair of the Education Committee the week after I accepted the job, but before I started in September 1993. And in that interim, we decided to meet twice weekly, usually over a Balti. And over the next decade, we met to solve many difficult issues, often just to listen to groups from different communities, always looking to improve the educational experiences of those within the city. I always thought Andy epitomised Birmingham's forward motto. He was always searching for ways to improve his beloved city. And he should not gain the impression from what I am saying as an officer that it was in my or anyone else's pocket. He asked awkward questions and forensic questions and made me feel that I was no better than I ought to be. 
That, for me, sums up Andy. He was renowned for having a unique and relaxed way of coping with the big issues of the day, which I think came from two teenage experiences. The first was the loss of his youngest brother from a tragic accident, and the second, a lucky escape from an IRA bomb placed under the family car in Moseley when his dad was Labour Minister in 1974. And those who knew him personally came to understand how his infectious sense of humour and often irreverent comments came from a brutal understanding of how precious life is and what drove him forward in so many endeavours to improve the lives of his fellow citizens. His often mischievous way was balanced with a formidable intellect and in his quiet and assuming way he helped transform all aspects of Birmingham services but especially education. It was Andy who 21 years ago as deputy leader established Sendias for parents and carers of children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. What foresight he showed in recognising that Birmingham's most vulnerable children needed a strong, independent voice. And that's important now as it was all those years ago. Andy's influence spread far beyond Birmingham, not just through his work as a councillor, but in his work with the voluntary sector over three decades. Our paths crossed quite often in various forms, and I was delighted when he asked whether his son Kieran could volunteer for Warsaw Citizens Advice Bureau. And in all the years I was at Warsaw, I don't think anybody got through their training modules as quickly or as comfortably as Kieran. And he's a senior member of staff now at Coventry Citizens Advice, a credit to Andy and his family. Andy stopped being a councillor in 2003, but that didn't lessen his appetite for politics or diminish his achievements. He had a network of contacts throughout the UK that had to be seen to be believed. And many people from, uh, benefited from Andy's advice, mentoring and encouragement over the years. Indeed, there are some in this chamber who are here because of Andy's support. He saw the value in surrounding himself with bright, committed people and the Labour Party was truly his extended family. Indeed, his loyalty to the Labour Party never wavered, despite never being selected as a candidate again after 2003. And I remember once on a long drive back from Scotland when discussing his deselection, he quoted that line from Godfather Part 2, This is the business we have chosen. No point complaining. Andy's achievements outside the City Council through the many consultancies he undertook never stopped right up to the day he died. Earlier this year he became Chair of New Routes, an exempt accommodation provider in trouble with the regulator. He put together a new board and immediately pulled out of the exempt accommodation sector, saying the leasehold model is intrinsically unsafe. He told Inside Housing... You have got to be comfortable that it's supporting people in the right way. You need to be convinced that it provides a good service and value for money. And we are not convinced on either of these points. Acting in an honest and principled way at the age of 64 in 2021, as he did when elected to the council aged 34 in 1991. I've left my fondest memories of Andy to the end. Um, our passion, some would say our obsession, was hill walking. And indeed, thanks to his blog, Must Be This Way, Andy is as well known nationally for his walking exploits as for his political achievements. I have to say we are very different in our approaches, as befits someone like me brought up in a Stalinist household. I have objectives every year in terms of miles, hills to climb and routes to walk. Andy is the complete opposite. He is happiest simply doing long walks. He's designed himself miles from civilization, most often in the Scottish Highlands, usually wild camping with only basic facilities. He did persuade me to wild camp with him on a few occasions, and one I vividly remember. We camped in Corrie Lair, uh, miles from anywhere, by the side of a small lochan, and were both woken up at around 5am with the sound of splashing water. We both peered out of our tents to see two young red deer chasing each other in and out of the lochan. 
we watched them for what seemed like an age. And that vision has struck me many times over the past few weeks. And Andy simply looked at me and said, this is why I prefer to wild camp. Ironically, after being tutored by Andy, I now design most of my own walks, but I have to say I haven't fallen in love with wild camping the way Andy did. I'm standing down from the council in May next year and Andy and I have talked about the walks we would do together and Wainwright's Coast to Coast was top of our list. How desperately sad that he w won't be able to do that. But I still plan to do the walk and uh, as has been the case with many of the walks I've done over the past few weeks, Andy's been with me in spirit. He leaves a beloved son, Kieran, and wife, Kate, who are both devastated by the tragic loss of a father, husband, and soulmate. They, like countless friends and colleagues, will miss Andy's passionate interest in so many things, but particularly music, literature, walking, and, of course, politics. He left the world, but especially Birmingham, the city he loved, the richer for his deeds. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. On behalf of the Conservative Group, I would like to pay tribute to Councillor Andy Howe and associate myself with the comments entirely from Councillor Carl Rice. I didn't know Andy that well as we only served together on the City Council for one year, 2002 to 2003. But we did have a couple of things in common. Uh, our wards... Uh, my then ward of Bourneville, his ward of Bourne of Moseley, shared a boundary. So there were issues of mutual concern that we talked about. And indeed, Andy did express um, his, uh, that he couldn't quite believe that Kings Heath Park at that time was in my ward of Bourneville and not in, in Moseley, which also covered uh, the majority of Kings Heath local shopping centre. And we also served on the same constituency committee, the Selly Oak constituency committee, or the then Selly Oak constituency committee, which consisted of Selly Oak Ward, Bonneville Ward, Mosley Ward and Kings Norton Ward at the time. So, uh, so I, did, I did speak to Andy on several occasions um, during that period. Um, but also, I know that Andy had a reputation as a formidable campaigner. Because my old friend and colleague Ken Hardiman represented Mosley alongside Andy between 92 and 96. But as Councillor Carl Rice said, uh, Andy became a councillor in Mosley in 1991 when he beat Ken Hardiman. And again, they faced off against each other in 99. And I well remember Ken Hardiman speaking to me on election night in 99, uh, saying that uh, despite Ken getting nearly 3,000 votes, he hadn't got elected. And the reason why? Because Andy got more than 3,000 votes. And uh, he said wherever he went in Moseley, you know, people were speaking about Andy Howe, and he knew how popular Andy was throughout the ward of Moseley, and what a formidable campaigner, as I say, Andy was. And I think it's a great tribute to Andy um, that when he stood down in 2003, and if you look at the election results and compare from the last time he won in 1999 and beat Ken, uh, the Labour vote fell by uh, a third, which I think just demonstrates how well liked uh, Andy was as a ward councillor in Moseley and, and, and what a campaigner he was for all the causes that Councillor Wright talked about uh, just a few moments ago. So on behalf of the Conservative group, we would like to fully endorse Councillor Rice's comments and our condolences to his family. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Goes from Mike Ward. Lord Mayor, I was so shocked to hear of Andy's demise last month at the tender age of 64. I hadn't been aware that he was in any way other than fit and healthy. Of course, we never expect those younger than ourselves to depart before us. Andy chaired the Education Committee from 1993 to 1996, when he was only in his 30s. But of course, he had a good political pedigree. Those were the years when I knew Andy best, as I was our group's education spokesperson. 
They were the years of the John Major government pre-Tony Blair, and Andy and I agreed on most matters regarding education in this city. We were in agreement 20 years later too, when National Express made the strange decision to not stop their buses at every stop on certain routes in South Birmingham. Andy and I separately ridiculed this idea, and it lasted just a few weeks. My colleague John Hunt joined the council just as Andy left, but John bumped into Andy a couple of years ago in Borsal Heath, where Andy had been involved in trying to get a parish council. He gave John some handy tips for the neighbourhood plan referendum that Perry Barr had only last week. Andy was a lovely man, always pleasant, always friendly, and always keen to work with political opponents rather than against them. The word world will miss him. Now I am saddened to announce the death of former councillor Dorothy Hargreave, who passed away on 15th October. Dorothy served on the council from 2006 to 2014, during which time she served on numerous committees. I know that you will join me in extending our deepest condolences to members of Dorothy's family. I move that this council places on record its sorrow at the death of former councillor Dorothy Hargreaves and its appreciation of her devoted service to the residents of Birmingham. The council extends its deepest sympathy to members of Dorothy's family in their sad bereavements. Would members and officers please stand for one minute silence. Please be seated. I will now call upon councillors to pay tribute to former councillor Dorothy Hargreaves, first councillor Seamus Spence. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, first of all, let me express on behalf of the Labour Group condolences to the family and friends of Dorothy Hargraves. Lord Mayor, though it is a sad occasion, I feel privileged to be able to give this tribute this afternoon. Dorothy Hargraves entered politics in her latter life. She had a lot of, of skills, some of which was not displayed while she was in the council. But her constituency, they know of her skills. She was an excellent cook. She made cakes for our <coughs> constituents and often provided birthday cakes for people she knew. She was very caring and treated her constituents as one big family. Lord Mayor, 
if though she entered politics in her latter years, no one could tell because the way she would go around the ward, the way she would talk with the residents, the things she will do for the residents, it's unbelievable. Sometimes I have to say to her, I had to say to her, you cannot visit everybody because it would be impossible for you to do that. She would say, Sybil, I want to visit as many people as I possibly can. I said, yes, that is important. But you know you will burn yourself out. It is important that you would ask them mm -hmm. to come to your advice bureau, mm -hmm. take the cases up, and then look after their needs. Lord Mayor, mm -hmm. um, the more I said, mm -hmm. is the more she, go, she done. Mm -hmm. So I just left it. It is important for us to know that even though somebody may be a bit older than their younger counterparts, it's not always that they will be docile. She was so swift on her feet, very fast around everywhere and delivering leaflets mm. and doing so many things for the ward. Mm. Lord Mayor, she will be very missed. One, obvious by her family, but her constituents will miss her mm. also. Lord Mayor, she made her name yeah. and her place mm. in the heart of the people. You know, I can remember some time when she left the council, she would ring me and she would say to me, Sybil, I'm praying for you. Nobody knows that I'm a Christian, you know, but I prayed every night for you. I said, yes, I can feel your prayers because that is what is keeping me. So I can tell that somebody is praying for me. Lord Mayor, she was a wonderful person. Yeah. I'm not repeating myself. Yeah. She will be sadly missed yeah. by every single person who knew her. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Mayor. All right. Next I call upon Councilor Mackey. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. I rise before you today uh, to give our tribute on behalf of the Conservative group to uh, Dorothy Hargreaves. Um, I did not have to have the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Dorothy uh, with her stepping down, coinciding with me uh, coming to the council, but um, I have spoken to people who knew her and uh, it does come across her how much of a warm and caring uh, individual that she was, not just to people of her own party and her own residents, but also to those of uh, opposition uh, parties. Um, as we've heard, Dorothy served Soho Ward between 2006 and uh, 2014, and she was an active uh, member of many committees during her time in office. Uh, the two that seemed to stand out most uh, for me was uh, she seemed to be a stalwart of the licensing committee, serving every one of her eight years uh, on licensing, but it also stood out that health and social care were uh, two items that seemed very close to her heart and something that she campaigned for um, vociferously. In 2010, uh, the, at the Soho Community Awards, uh, she received an award for her work uh, in the ward, and I think it always means something when the ward, ward residents themselves are the ones that uh, um, uh, put you forward uh, for an award. Um, 
She was also a staunch defender of the uh, city's Meals on Wheels service and um, uh, was always, always looking to make sure that they, there was the ultimate quality and choice available. Uh, the Conservative group uh, send our condolences to our family and friends. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. On behalf of my colleagues in the Liberal Democrat group, we would like to pay tribute to the service that Dorothy made to the City Council. As Councillor Mackay just said, she was a warm and caring individual. And that can be seen by the committees that she served on in the Council, because apart from the purgatory that she obviously endured with licensing and planning, uh, she was foremost involved in the caring side of the City Council. And it is that really that is the tribute to her and her service on the City Council that we should all be grateful for. So on behalf of my group, the Liberal Democrats, we'd like to extend to her family our condolences at their loss. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Finally, we continue to pay tribute to former colleagues who lost during coronavirus restrictions by remembering former Councillor Dilawar Khan, whose passing was announced at the Council meeting in June last year. Dilawar served as a Councillor for Spar Brook Ward from June 2004 to May 2007 and passed away on 16th May 2020, following a long illness. He leaves behind his wife Shameem and two sons, Afsar and Shafiq, and I know you will join me in extending to them our deepest condolences. I move that this council places on record its sorrow at the death of former councillor Dilawar Khan and its appreciation of its devoted service to the residents of Birmingham. The council extends its deepest sympathy to members of Dilawar's family in their sad bereavements. Would members and officers please stand up for one minute silence. <coughs> Please be seated. I will now call upon councillors to pay tribute to former councillor Dilawar Khan. First, councillor Malik. <coughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I would like to thank the Labour Group for inviting me to pay tribute to Councillor Dilawar Khan, the former elected member for the then Sparkbrook Ward. Dilawar Khan sadly passed away on the 16th of May 2020 following a, a year-long battle with lung cancer. He leaves behind his wife, Shamim, and two sons, Afsar and Shafiq. I personally knew him 
when he was a councillor and dealt with him as an officer and also as a resident of the ward. Dilawa Khan was a very principled person. He was very ple pleasant and helpful person who would do, go the extra mile in helping people. Dilawa, as you said, uh, Lord Mayor, was a Liberal Democrat councillor and during the time on the City Council, he served as a member on the following committees. Development Control Committee, Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Planning Committee, Regeneration Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Transportation and Street Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Education Awards Subcommittee. Lord Mayor, I know a lot of people who knew the lover and all speak highly of him and pay tribute to his commitment, community work, even when he left the council, which shows the passion that he had for the people of Birmingham. Lord Mayor, on behalf of the Labour Group, we send our heartfelt and deepest condolences to the Lava's family, friends, neighbours and the people of the city that he had the honour of serving. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I rise on behalf of the Conservative Group to give our condolences to the family of former Councillor Dali Khan following his sad passing in May 2020, following a year-long battle with lung cancer. He leaves behind his wife, Shamim and sons, Asfar and Shafiq. Dwala was a Lib Dem councillor for Sparbrook Ward between 2004 and 2007. Although I was only on the councillor for one year during that time, um, I did learn a bit about his interests. And as you've seen from the committee list that was circulated and heard um, from the, the list already read out, his interests very much lay around the regeneration of his local community and obviously the planning um, and transportation impacts that that has with that. Although he did also sit on the Social Care Committee. What people may not realise, though, was outside of the council. He spent 12 years on the Birmingham Trade Union um, Council Centre for the Unemployed as well doing all he could to help support vulnerable people in the city. In 2007, some may remember, he suffered a broken nose and bruising to his face after a meeting of the Sparkbrook Neighbourhood Forum on a Sunday afternoon. He told the press at the time that things turned nasty after he put questions to the chair of the meeting about a report that he'd been promised months ago but had yet to be circulated to the community. This disgraceful incident does so much to remind us about his character as an individual. This is a person who was spending what would most people consider to be their free time on a Sunday afternoon, representing his local community, asking the challenging questions, standing up for them to make sure that his community was both heard and got the answers that they deserve. Lord Mayor, may we add our comments to those already shared with the Chamber and send our thoughts and prayers to former Councillor Khan's family and friends. Thank you. Sorry, I should have called Councillor John at first. My apologies for that. Councillor John Hunt. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. As Councillor Dilawa Khan was a, a Liberal Democrat councillor briefly, but as we have heard during three years on the council, perhaps belied his, his contribution and role in the community of Sparkbrook and belied the person he was. Uh, the general description was, and I, I knew him as a councillor, was that he was a very decent, hard-working man. He was a lovely person to be with, uh, very affable, very pleasant, um, but also, as we've heard, a, a, a core of steel and an ability to do things. Um, Dilawa was born in Gorgashti in Pakistan and came to Birmingham in the late 50s with his father uh, as a child. Um, he gained an engineering degree um, in, in this country uh, and, and then went and spent a decade in Saudi Arabia working on telecoms with BT um, and he then came back to his country um, this country and, and ran a, a family store uh, he then became a, a, a councillor following the um, uproar over the war in Iraq of course which led to Sparkbrook very briefly being two Liberal Democrat councillors in Sparkbrook Ward um, and um, was, was there for three years but he always um, retained his affection and love for his hometown. So during many years he was fundraising uh, amongst his community and family and friends 
for, for significant projects in that town of Gorgashti. He was involved in getting roads developed there. He was involved in getting a mosque developed there. Um, he, he was somebody um, with a real passion to do the right thing um, and somebody who, who gained respect even from people um, who, who were not on the same political wavelength as him. Um, it is a terrible sadness for his family to have lost him through that dreadful disease of lung cancer and a terrible sadness of course that they had to lay him to rest during the height of the pandemic when they could only have a very very small funeral when I'm sure there would be many more people who would have loved to attend. Um, so our condolences of our group lie with his wife Shamir, his two sons Afsa and Shafiq and also their nine granddaughters and uh, that, that lovely family he leaves behind. Uh, thank you Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. My next is an uh, announcement and now I would just like to remind you that to, today we launched the annual puppy appeal. Birmingham is one of only five cities to have a city puppy day so I was pleased to meet with some of the, our serving military personnel at New City Station this morning and have the opportunity to thank the volunteers, both military and civilian. Thank you. Our next item is petitions. We now move on to the agenda item relating to the petitions. I move that the petitions presented before the meeting be received and referred to the relevant chief officer to examine and report as appropriate. Is that seconded? Agreed. Is that agreed? agreed? Thank you. I have a list of those who want to present petition and will invite you to do so. Please note that it is intended to seek that all the petitions are seconded and agreed together when all the petitions have been presented. Please present your petition and return to your seat, as I said already, that all petitions will be seconded and agreed together when all petitions have been presented. Please can you also clearly state the details of the petition and which director or directorate the petition relates to. And may I remind you that this is not an opportunity to make a speech. Could I also ask you to ensure that your name is on the front page of the petition. Please hand petition to an officer. Are there any more petitions? Please raise your hand. <clears throat> now, first is Councillor Major Mahmood. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. I have a petition to present on behalf of Councillor Mohamed Iklak, Ward End Board, who's, who's abroad. Uh, the petition reads, We, the undersigned, object to AK Supermarket 868 Washwood East Road B82NG, reference 122908, been granted an alcohol licence under Section 2 and Section 17 of the Licensing Act 2003. This will further exacerbate the already high levels of crime, ASB and loitering in a densely residential area with nearby schools, nursery and children's play areas. We therefore strongly urge Birmingham City Council and the police to unanimously reject their application. Thank you. I move that this goes to the Licensing Committee, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Sorry, my apologies. I didn't quite hear from the back too well. Um, thank you, Lord, uh, Lord Mayor. I wish to um, put forward a petition on behalf of the residents of Northfield Road outside their house because they have a situation, Lord Mayor, where they can park their cars uh, on a Saturday 
uh, and a Sunday, an all day on a Sunday, but between the hours of 7.45 a.m. in the morning to 6.45 p.m., they're not allowed to do that. And what the residents are now asking for, Lord Mayor, is for the removal of the traffic regulation order that is in place, so it means that they'll be able to park there 24-7. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I have uh, several petitions to present. Uh, the first one is a petition from residents of Hall Green opposed to the installation of telecommunications equipment, namely a 20 metre high monopole for equipment cabinets and ancillary development works at 176 Highfield Road, Hall Green B280HT. Uh, I propose this goes to the planning department. The second petition is from residents of Hall Green South Ward, calling on Birmingham City Council to carry out the necessary remedial work to prevent ponding, surface water flooding, at the separate crossing along Robin Hood Lane by the junction with Highfield Road, Hall Green. My third petition is from residents of Hall Green South Ward, calling on Birmingham City Council to install a CCTV camera at the fly tipping hotspot along Highfield Road between the parade shops uh, between Coal Valley Road and Paradise Lane, Hall Green. Uh, fourth petition is a petition for residents for Green South Ward calling on Birmingham City Council to install a CCDV camera at the fly tipping hotspot uh, by Marion Way, Hall Green. Uh, my next petition is a petition from residents of Hall Green South Ward calling on Birmingham City Council to introduce a Birmingham wide injunction on our parks and public open spaces so that any unauthorised traveller encampments could be removed much faster. I propose this goes to parks. Um, or regulation enforcement, whichever is most appropriate. My next petition is a petition from residents of Hall Green South Ward calling on Birmingham City Council to resurface the entire carriageway along both Gracemere Crescent and Barbara Road, Hall Green. And my final petition is a petition from residents of Hall Green South Ward calling on Birmingham City Council to resurface the entire carriageway along both Highfield Road, especially between the River Coal Bridge and Robin Hood Lane, and also along Robin Hood Lane between Coal Valley Road and Highfield Road, and I propose that goes to highways. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Lord Mayor. Councillor William Young. The end. Collectively, collectively. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have four petitions. First petition is for Cliveden Avenue to have a right turn onto Warsaw Road. We, the undersigned, request for uh, Cliveden Avenue to have a right turn onto Warsaw Road as this will stop illegal U-turns taking place and will make it safer for residents who live here and use this road. Before the flyover was built, there was a right turn onto Warsaw Road. Now that the fly flyover has been removed, it makes sense to reinstate the right turn by traffic light system. And can this please be given to the relevant department? Okay, okay, next. Have Sorry? you got another one? Yes, okay. I'll carry on with the other ones. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Lord Mayor. Second petition is for CCTV cameras on Oscott Road to, de to deter fly tipping. We, the undersigned, request CCTV cameras to help deter continuous fly tipping in Oscott Road, Perry Bar. Fly tipping has become an ongoing issue on this street. CCTV cameras would, will, would deter fly tipping and help with the prosecution of perpetrators. Thank you. And can this also be given to the relevant department? Third petition is for bleed control kits, which I promise that I will, this will be ongoing. We, the undersigned, would like bleed control kits, not just in Perry Bar, but also across the city. This will enable bystanders to help stop the bleed in cases where someone has been shot or stabbed, as bystanders are always the first at the scene. These kits should be available at taxi ranks, shisha cafes, pubs, nightclubs, schools, hostels, prisons, and also we would like the relevant training to be provided to teach people how to use these kits. And can this also go to the relevant department, please? Last petition is for the objection to be proposed for change of use of former university student accommodation at Oscott Gardens. A change of use to temporary residential accommodation providing a total of 414 rooms with shared facilities to be used as a hostel for homeless families. 
has been proposed for the former university student accommodation at Ascot Gardens. We, the undersigned, object to this proposal. Can this also go to the relevant department, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Alden. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have two petitions to hand in. One is from residents objecting to planning application 2021-08500-PA. And the other one is objecting to planning application 2021-07474-PA. And I ask their case to the planning committee. Thank you very much. Councillor Zakajosi. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have a petition from 212 people from Gilbertstone Avenue. They are requesting road reservice. And could this go to highway? Also, I have a three-page email from residents. Could this go to the leader, the cabinet member for transportation, and also highways, please? Thank you. Councilor Sheldon Thompson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I've got a petition from residents in North Edgebaston who are asking for um, the council to do an all options business case on um, a resident parking scheme of over 15 roads because of the traffic and the um, poor parking that happens around the road surrounding Dudley Road. They're also asking that we can have a consultation process with those residents that live in those streets to see if they are they are up for this and if it can be implemented. I ask that this goes to highways and also transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mariam Khan. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I have a petition on behalf of residents of Gowan Road in Allen Rock. Residents are concerned about speeding and dangerous driving on their road. The residents would like traffic calming measures to be explored, including the consideration of speed ramps. I move that this petition goes to the relevant department. Thank you. Thank you. Go see. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I have two petitions here. The first is a petition calling for an injunction to be introduced at Daisy Farm Park to stop unauthorised traveller encampments and for the Council to look at additional defensive measures to stop incursions. I move that goes to the relevant department. And the second one is a petition calling for all parks and green spaces in the Billsley Ward to be given further defensive measures and injunctions introduced to protect from unauthorised encampments. I move that goes to the relevant department. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. A petition of the residents of the Old Field Road, Birmingham B12, 8 TN. That is about the carpenter house that is going to be changed to the homeless hostel. And uh, there are 106 people are against this one. And this should to be go to the planning and re re regeneration department. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Who would like to present the petition? Yes, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have a petition uh, signed by over 100 residents uh, of Walmart in Menworth uh, calling on National Express, uh, National Express to urgently review the levels of bus services <coughs> provided to Wormley and Minworth, where recent changes have led to a reduction in service levels, uh, leading to lone travellers being stranded or feeling vulnerable at bus stops. 
It also calls on Transport for West Midlands to exert pressure on National Express, especially as the Pedimore and Langley developments come on stream, where access to reliable and frequent public transport services will be essential for their, ex their success. And I move that I go to transportation. Thank you. Any other member who wants to present the petition? No. Now I move that all these petitions are seconded. Seconded. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. I will request members again that please wipe the wipe down the lectern after you have made your speech. A petition update has been made available electronically. I move that the petition update be noted and those petitions for which a satisfactory response has been received be discharged. Is that seconded? Is that agreed? Is that agreed? agreed. Thank you. Item 6. The next item is to deal with the oral questions. Question from members of the public to any cabinet member or ward forum chair. I understand there are no public questions to be asked today in this meeting. So we move on to the next questions. Question from councils to a committee chairman, lead member of a joint board or ward forum chair. I, I understand there is a Councilor Mariam John, she wants to ask the question to the Chair of Planning Committee. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question to Car Councillor Karen McCarthy is, I'm sure the Chair of Planning will join me in congratulating the residents of Perry Bar in making the second statutory neighbourhood plan in the city last Thursday with 93% support. Will the chair meet with myself and my ward colleague, Councillor Hunt, and other representatives of the Three Bs Neighbourhood Planning Forum to discuss how the plan will be used to improve the quality of planning applications and approvals in the plan area? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Chairman of the Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Jan. I do indeed join with you in congratulating the residents uh, of the Three Bs area in a, a voting in favour of their neighbourhood plan um, through both my planning responsibilities and my neighbourhood um, responsibilities as Cabinet Advisor. Uh, I am very happy to encourage residents across the, the city to look at the different ways in which they can build their neighbourhoods, um, including uh, through the, the planning process. I'd be happy to meet. Um, it may be uh, a better option for you to meet with officers, but let's explore that. Thank you. Thank you. The next is question is from Councillor Paltis to Chair of Licensing and Public Protection Committee. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It is to Councillor Phil Davis. Uh, what does it take to remove a licence of a public house, namely George V in Common Lane, Sheldon? It's been a long-standing problem over a number of years. Licensing officers visit weekly, more or less, in response to complaints from me on behalf of the residents regarding very loud music, quote unquote, from the licensee, I'll play the music as loud as I want, it's my pub, and the general antisocial behaviour. There are large gatherings of cars in the car park, screeching up and down Common Lane, leading to visits from the traffic police. That has to be a first in itself. Only last Friday, the police visited in response to antisocial behaviour and allegations of drug dealing. How long 
do residents have to endure the continual disturbance to their lives? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Chair of the committee, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor, um, and thank you, Councillor Tilsey, for the question. And can I add my best wishes to you on recovery from your uh, hip replacement, and good to see you back at full council. Um, I have been given some information about this issue by the officers, and um, we're very much aware of it um, uh, as an ongoing issue. The difficulty, though, I'm told, is that while there have been complaints, understandably, to the local members, um, and we all get the sort of complaint where uh, obviously there is something going on but people are a bit reluctant to then pin their colours to the mask in terms of uh, actually coming forward with evidence. I'm told that that is the difficulty. Um, despite the regular visits, really environmental health uh, and the other agencies have not been given sufficient um, indication from people who would be witnesses in any action to provide sufficient evidence on these issues. Now the um, the licence holder has been spoken to uh, and there has been some action taken I'm told in terms of changes around access and egress from the pub. I'm not saying that's caused the problems, um, it's an ongoing issue that as I say is recognised by the department but the difficulty is we don't have yet sufficient information um, to take further measures but I can assure Councillor Tilsley that if that information is provided, uh, if people are willing to come forward and I'm sure the same goes for the police as well and obviously we work very closely with the police on licensing matters, then action will be taken but it is necessary to gather that, that information at this stage um, and um, one suggestion is that uh, the local members with our offices may like to hold a meeting with residents um, and uh, that would obviously give an opportunity to talk about what we need from people about the issues which have been continuing at this particular premises for some time. So um, if that meeting uh, can be arranged, which I'm sure it can, uh, and the officers are willing to take the initiative on that with the local members, then um, we can perhaps make some progress on what I accept is an issue uh, for uh, Councillor Tilsley's ward. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. The next section is question from the councillors other than the cabinet members to a cabinet member. Please note that all questions to the cabinet members, Councillor Carton, Francis, Councillor Francis, Councillor and Councillor Zuffer will be answered by the leader. The first is Councillor Peter Fowler. First question. Councillor Peter Fowler. No question. Councillor Mahmoud Hussain. Could you keep the Thank you, Lord May. I have a question for Councillor Shibrana Hussain, Cabinet Member for uh, Neighbourhoods, uh, Homes and Neighbourhoods. Uh, in the world I represent, we are seeing a significant negative impact in the local community for ex exempt accommodation and HMOs. This is causing a lot of antisocial behavior, distress to the local residents, and call outs to, to the neighborhood policing team. In mapping up out the location of HMOs and exempt accommodation, is the social uh, economy impact on the local community taken into consideration? Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, the increase in exempt accommodation right across the city is causing similar problems in uh, many areas across the city, and it's something that requires action. Uh, as you'll be aware, uh, Councillor Hussain, Birmingham was one of five local authorities invited by the Department for Leveling Up Homes and Communities to take part in a national pilot looking into the supported uh, exempt housing sector. One key element of this was to undertake a strategic needs assessment and subsequent development of a supported housing strategy for the future. This work will capture the impact information that you have asked for, alongside the findings from the inspection and oversight activity we've undertaken to date as part of this pilot. We are hoping to have this work completed within the next two months as part of the post-pilot evaluation, and I will, of course, share the findings with you at that point. But I have a supplementary question as well. Um, what current action is the Cabinet member taking to ensure that this code created by HMOs and exempt accommodation is mitigated in Birmingham and in particular in my ward uh, of Birchfield to reassure my community further has the, she made any representation to the government to assist the City Council to resolve the serious issue. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. In actual fact, Birmingham uh, City Council has been the leading local authority nationally in seeking to get this issue of uh, um, exempt accommodation uh, tackled. Uh, we are and have been in discussion with government for some time on this matter. It does, of course, uh, need government intervention to, to, to solve the problem ultimately. In addition to that, uh, scrutiny will be reporting next month with a series of recommendations uh, in this particular area as well. Uh, the Cabinet member will continue to uh, work uh, to come up with a resolution to this problem and we'll continue our dialogue with the government. Thank you. The next is Councillor Robert Allen. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I have a question for uh, John Cotton, the Cabinet Member for New Safe. I understand, obviously, Councillor Ward will be stepping in in his place, which is fine. Um, last week, women and others in Birmingham and across the country took part in a girls' night in to highlight the ongoing risk from spiking, be it by needle or in drinks. This clearly is a horrific crime and one which has had an increase in reporting in recent months, and one which must be tackled. It's simply not right that so many women in our city are left feeling so unsafe at night. Will the Cabinet member host a cross-party roundtable between the three-party leads, the business in premium districts, nighttime venues, specialists in safety advice to police, and any of the relevant stakeholders to help tackle, tackle this ghastly crime, including looking at how to get specialist mobile health professionals for venues? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, for once, I find myself in agreement with the uh, Leader of the Opposition. The um, spiking of drinks and the uh, threats to uh, women and girls who are going out into the nighttime economy is wholly unacceptable and it needs to be uh, stamped out. I will speak to the Cabinet Member about uh, hosting the cross-party round table that you've suggested. In actual fact, um, Councillor John Cotton hosted a similar round table in response to the homophobic attacks in the uh, gay village that have been going on uh, across recent months and there was a very, very positive outcome from that round table. So I will uh, speak to Councillor Cotton about uh, the Leader of the Opposition's suggestion. Yes, I do, Lord Mayor, and thank you very much for that answer, Councillor Wood. Um, appreciating that the Council has a hate crime cracker, but given the ongoing issues both with spiking and the recent spate of disgusting homophobic attacks in the gay village, as the Leader just referenced, um, will the Leader form a cross-party working group with the three leads in this area and other relevant stakeholders to work on a comprehensive nighttime safety plan to help keep all visitors to Birmingham City Centre safe and feeling welcomed at night? Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I uh, already referenced that the uh, the Cabinet Member, Councillor Cotton, had held a uh, roundtable uh, 
in response to homophobic attacks in the gay quarter, which are, again, wholly unacceptable and uh, not welcome in, in this city, and we are determined that they will be driven uh, out. Uh, as a result of that roundtable, a comprehensive uh, series of uh, actions are proposed. Um, so, as I said, in answer to uh, the Leader of the Opposition's initial question, I will speak to the Cabinet member about uh, the merits of a similar cross-party roundtable in respect of attacks or um, the spiking of drinks, or indeed actually injections is the other uh, uh, accusation, uh, that are aimed at women and girls uh, who are going out into the nighttime economy. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is for the Cabinet Member for Street Scene and Parks, Councillor John O'Shea. My ward of Allen Rock has just yesterday had its second visit of the Mobile Household Recycling Centre and at our first one last month we had a record-breaking 30 tonnes of rubbish and recycling collected. Feedback from our residents has been very positive and they are grateful for the initiative coming into local areas. We found that residents used the opportunity to not only dispose of their own unwanted items and rubbish but some also made numerous trips to the MHRCs helping neighbours and elderly family members to also benefit from the service by bringing their items as well. It has certainly been a massive hit in Allen Rock. Residents are already asking about the next one. My question is, has any other ward in the city beaten our record of 30 tonnes collected in one visit and do you have the figures for our visit yesterday? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Khan, and uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, for the question. Um, I don't think we can quite confirm that you've broken the 30 tonnes record so far, but I do know that there was at least 28 tonnes collected yesterday in Allen Rock, so it's on the cars that you have already broken your own record. I can also confirm to the Council that during September, the initial figures can suggest that our initiatives to tackle fly tipping and waste across the city cleared 430 tonnes of waste from Birmingham streets. Over 110 tonnes of that came from mobile HRCs alone. These have been a huge success across the city and welcomed in, I think they've been across every ward now, but if not they will be soon. And so much so that I believe even the Lib Dems have claimed them as their own idea. Uh, now we know that cleaner, greener streets matter most to people of this city. And I am hugely proud that we have managed to find, thanks to uh, careful financial management, some £7 million pounds to put into that, that, that work this year. And we will carry on and we'll get our streets cleaned up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Do you want a supplementary? Yes, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm genuinely really excited about that figure. It's weird, I know, but um, thank you for that update. Where the tonnage is definitely an interesting figure to ask about, we can always try to reduce this wherever possible. Some residents had items that they no longer needed but were in relatively good condition. Are there any plans in place to support a reusing service for residents? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Deputy, thank you, uh, Councillor Khan, for your question. Uh, yes. Uh, we, we already have plans to have a van available to collect items that can be reused when they are brought to our ring sites. And I should also tell the Council that we have a new reuse site that's opened at our Tisley uh, Household Recycling Centre where people can bring and buy items that have been collected and can be reused. So we are taking our um, responsibility to ensure that items get reused very seriously. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is to the Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care, Councillor Paulette Hamilton. Uh, would the Cabinet Member wish to comment on the recent and outrageous attacks that have been made by some members of the public on GPs, NHS and social care workers. 
both verbally and in social media. Given that health and care workers have been applauded on doorsteps throughout the country for their commitment to our health and are exhausted after nearly two years battling against the pandemic, not to say funding shortages, would the Cabinet member agree that we need to support the health and care workers in this country and condemn the minority who are turning on the very people who are keeping us alive? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Polcock, for that question. Can I start by saying um, I was shocked when I heard that people were actually um, turning on healthcare workers. For the last 18 months, they have been phenomenal, not just healthcare workers, but other workers out there and social care workers. Without them, we could not have got through this pandemic. And for myself, I absolutely agree with Councillor Pocock and I applaud the work that they've done over the last um, 18 months. And anyone that seeks to condemn them or say anything negative, all I can say to them is shame on you. Thank you. Councillor Polka. Any supplement? Any supplement? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have. Um, everybody wants to get access to their GP in the best way that suits them. And there is evidently some confusion about the ways of accessing primary care at the moment. However, not everyone wants to return to face to face appointments and sitting with other potentially ill people in waiting rooms, and a growing number wish to use modern telemedicine or telephone as their preferred route. So would the Cabinet member wish to comment on the recent government scheme which appears to penalise GPs for developing these alternative channels and with perverse incentives to revert to face-to-face -face appointments even when patients would prefer the alternatives? Again, thank you, Lord Mayor, for allowing me to speak, and thank you, Councillor Polcock. When um, that question is quite a deep question, because our GPs, as many of you know, during the pandemic, we had large issues. We had many issues. I've discussed this, actually, with um, Councillor Matt Bennett. We had many issues with GPs retiring, the age of our GPs, and they were actually at breaking point when we got to the pandemic the issue has been, during the pandemic, our healthcare workers, our GPs and people in primary care, they're tired. We need to look at new ways of working. We need to consider that hybrid model. Many people do like the new system of being online. Many people, especially our elderly, they want to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. What we need to do is ensure that we have a mix of both. What is not healthy? Helpful is when the Secretary of State for Health, Sajid Javid, makes unhelpful comments about GPs because we do need to look at how GPs are working, but attacking them is not going to get the new ways of working that we need. So to end, can I say the GPs do a phenomenal job. If people look at the figures, GPs have actually had more face-to-face -face visits since the pandemic than ever before. But the problem is we have less GPs because of the age demographic and other issues that are going, why they are leaving the sector. But they are seeing more patients, but in different ways. So I would like to say, GPs, well done. I truly appreciate what you're doing. And for those that feel they need to attack GPs, really not a good time when we're going into winter pressures. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And thank you, Rob. Councillor Peter Fodder.
Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor, very much indeed for the opportunity uh, to speak, and my apologies again uh, uh, to you. Uh, my question actually is to uh, Wazim Zafa and, in uh, fact, uh, John Cotton, and it's all about saving Birmingham wheels, of which we've all had in previous times a brochure and also the plans from the Birmingham wheels. And, Lord Mayor, to Councillor Wazim Zafa, John Cotton, in fact, the Cabinet, with over 5,000 petition signatures that I handed in some time ago, and a motion to this Council back in January 2010 to save the Birmingham wheels and over 2,000 jobs. Is this something that, with the removal and disappearance, which will be very sad for Birmingham and for our young people, and to all the visitors that come to that site at Birmingham Wheels, is that is Councillor Haf, um, Zavi, Wazim Zafa, beg your pardon, happy to know that you are likely to push young people, those with disabilities and other situations, of our young people in our city now onto the streets because they will have nowhere else to go. These people, Lord Mayor, work so hard training these young people about how to drive carefully, etc., etc. So I'm asking Councillor Zaffa and, of course, uh, Councillor Cotton as well, because we're also talking about social inclusion and equalities for all in our city. Will you move to keep our wheels firmly in Birmingham, at the Birmingham wheels, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. In order to understand um, what has been going on on the wheel site, first of all, you have to look at the history of what's going on, and then secondly, you have to be able to see the bigger picture, and I would hope that Councillor Fowler might be able to raise himself to do that. Uh, the wheel site itself was previously managed by a charitable company, which had a long lease on the site, would have secured that activity into, in the long term. However, due to non-payment of rent, the courts granted an order for possession of the site back on the 19th of November 2019 and the council subsequently took physical repossession at the site at the end of January 2020. In accordance with the resolution that was passed in this council meeting, officers negotiated with the remaining occupiers of the site regarding a temporary lease and subsequently a short-term contracted out lease was granted to one of the former occupiers of the site and that lease expires on the 31st of October 2021. The temporary leaseholder of the site has asked to extend the current short-term lease but that request has been turned down in order to allow site preparations to commence which will allow for the onward development and regeneration of the wheel site. A crucial part of the works includes the Council's legal responsibility to clear some 9,000 square metres of Japanese knotweed, which if not treated within the next growing season could considerably delay the regeneration of this site. And the reason why the City Council is bringing forward employment development on the site is set out in the Birmingham Development Plan and the Bordesley Park Area Action Plan and the East Birmingham Inclusive Growth Strategy. It's in response to the need to address the city's employment land supply and the long-standing challenges that exist in East Birmingham. The development of the site has the potential to deliver up to 1 million square feet of employment space with a scope for a range of industrial, manufacturing and warehouse facilities and will create up to 3,000 jobs. Employment and skills programmes will be put in place to connect these opportunities to the local community. And of course, the local community in East Birmingham is one of the most deprived in the city and experiences high levels of unemployment. And you may also be aware that the remediation of the wheel site was one of the successful levelling up fund bids announced by the government last week and we have secured some £17.145 million towards the creation of those 3,000 jobs. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The, there's only no timing for only one more question. question. Oh, yes, supplementary question. Thank you very much, in, uh, Lord Mayor. 
welcome the comments from the leader of the council. As he well knows that the Birmingham Wales has the full support of Sport England and talking to uh, the owners or the people involved in uh, Philip Bond, for example, who I met uh, the other day, who actually tells me that he's actually spoken, Lord Mayor, to people who deal with knotweed, and they have said they can work with them quite happily around the Birmingham wheels. And, and as well, under the Birmingham Development Plan, I'm still aware that it is the Council's duty to help them find an alternative site or to help them on the existing site. I'm seeing no evidence, Lord Mayor, that that is happening. And again, I call upon the Leader and his Cabinet to work with Birmingham Wheels to find a development that will ensure their continuation for the young people, for the adults, for this city of Birmingham, especially under sports with the Commonwealth Games. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. The Commonwealth Games is, of course, a fantastic opportunity for this city and its people. Motorsports do not form part of the Games themselves. I did say at the very beginning that you need to see the bigger picture here, and uh, unfortunately, Councillor Fowler seems to be uh, doing his best to ignore that bigger picture. There's the potential here for one million square feet of employment space, when employment space in this city is under extreme shortage and stress, and we, we need to we need to identify more employment space within the city in order that we can provide the jobs for our growing population in the future. It's also on this site 3,000 potential jobs that can be created. That is too big an opportunity for the council to ignore. Now regarding the relocation opportunities, property consultants currently acting for the city council um, for the development of the wheels site have conducted a search of potential alternative sites for the occupiers who are currently on site and a schedule of initial opportunities has been shared with them. Ultimately of course it is up to those users to relocate to these other opportunities that are presented to them. Most of the sites are unfortunately not in the Council's ownership and there are, in all fairness, a wide number of issues that would have to be explored, including suitability and availability in order for such a move to take place. However, on a more positive note, we are making significant progress on an alternative site for the Speed Skating Club. Now that's important because the Speed Skating Club is the only uh, non, uh, or is the only um, um, voluntary uh, sport that's operated uh, on the site uh, currently, and they do provide facilities for local people. And I believe actually they have uh, a young person currently who's on the brink of making it into the British speed skating team. So I'm particularly keen that we do find an alternative location for this voluntary club. However, I come back to the private sector operators on this site. We will do what we can to assist them with alternative uh, sites and, and venues, but ultimately they will have to decide where they wish to move to. Time for one question. Councillor Gatewood. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my question is to um, Cabinet Member for Street Scene and Parks, John O'Shea. The 2021 Chelsea Flower Show was the 108th uh, Flower Show and the first to be held in the autumn. I was delighted that Birmingham have, achieved, have um, continued to work with the fabulous Baroness Floella Benjamin and that the, um, this allowed us to... Uh, give some, um, sorry, and that the theme allowed us to give some positive examples of how we can make a positive environmental difference. Following our previous successes, can the Cabinet member please let us know how our team fared this year? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Booth, for your question. 
I'm delighted to confirm that for the ninth year in a row, despite the fact it being an autumn uh, event, with all the challenges that put forward, uh, we have secured another gold award for our, our parks team in Birmingham. As Councillor Booth points out, the, the exhibit was designed with, a, with the support of, uh, of uh, Baroness Quiller Benjamin, who's become adopted Brummie, uh, and uh, was yet again really well received. And if I'm honest, I think we were rather robbed of the Best in Show award for that particular um, field. But uh, again, a great success, uh, shows the quality of work done by our parks team across the city, and here's 2022. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Any supplementary question? No. no. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, councillor listed as due to ask a question at that point was Councillor Zaka Chowdhury. Now this is the second meeting in a row that no Liberal Democrat councillor has been called for this section of the agenda. So in terms of proportionality, the Liberal Democrats are now falling behind because we are being listed low and Councillor Chowdhury could have been called just then because he was due in order. Uh, Well, there are more people who were asking these questions and I have tried to accommodate actually people in, even in terms of proportions. So we could discuss this after the meeting, no doubt, but I, I express my concern that this is the second meeting in a row that no Liberal Democrat councillor has been called to put a question to a cabinet member. Now the next section is question from the councillors other than the cabinet members to leader or deputy leader. The final section under the order question is for question from councillors other than the time for this section is 20 minutes. I have a list of those wishing to ask questions. First is councillor Rob Dalton. Thank you Lord Mayor. Um, and first of all, I'd just say I very much agree with the comments, Councillor Aaron. It used to be the way that they all used to alternate between the three parties, and perhaps that would be a thing to go away and look back and bring back. Um, Lord Mayor, I have a question for the Leader of the Council. Labour Councillor, Councillor Ollie Armstrong, recently told the Birmingham Mail that Labour leaders care more about fighting the left than saving the planet. And talking about Birmingham Labour, he said that people in power right now have no idea. The Council recently agreed to move the Montague Street depot out of the clean air zone to avoid the vehicles having to pay the CAS charge, therefore pushing that pollution from the city centre into suburbs, not stopping any of it actually being emitted, instead of using that same money to electrify the fleet and stop the emissions being emitted at all. The relocation of the depot to avoid paying CAS charges is costing the Council over £13.5 million, enough money to buy 25 electric bin lorries and the required charging equipment to charge them. In the words of Councillor Armstrong, the people in power have no idea right now. So can the leader of the council explain by what year he expects to finally only purchase electric or LPG vehicles for the council fleet going forward? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Lord Mayor, in respect of uh, Councillor Ollie Armstrong, uh, unfortunately Councillor Armstrong is uh, burying his grandmother today. I'm sure that all of the people in this room would want to join me in giving condolences to him and his family for that sad event. Uh, on uh, the subject of the uh, relocation of uh, the Montague Street depot, the relocation of the uh, depot, first and foremost, is to facilitate a development uh, on that site, and it's uh, a strategically important development for the city as a whole. Moving on to the question of uh, electric uh, bin wagons, we are currently looking at uh, the option of purchasing uh, electric bin wagons in the future. However, what we don't want to be here is the first movers and uh, 
uh, expend uh, an enormous amount of uh, money only to find out that there are technical problems. So we will be working to replace the fleet, but unfortunately I'm not able to give a date to the Leader of the Opposition currently. Yes, I do, Lord Mayor. Thank you. On behalf of our group, we'd um, add our condolences to Councillor Armstrong and his family at this uh, time of his great loss. Apparently, Birmingham City Council, Lord Mayor, has ele less electric vehicles now than it did in the 1930s. The Birmingham Declaration, issued by the Progressive Partnership on the 1st of December in 2009, committed the Council to a number of actions, including the procurement of only electric or LPG vehicles by 2015. When Labour took office in 2012, the Birmingham Air Quality Action Plan at that time from the Conservative Lib Dem administration committed the Council to all vehicles procured by Birmingham City Council by 2015 being either electric or on an LPG. It's therefore no wonder that Councillor Armstrong said to the paper that the people in power have no idea right now. Birmingham Labour failed to deliver on that and they've now removed it from the Air Quality Action Plan altogether, changing their focus away from electrifying the fleet to instead discouraging private vehicle use. So, Lord Mayor, I ask this um, chamber, does the leader feel he's trying to stop people using, does he feel that trying to stop people using private vehicles is better than trying to electrify the council's fleet and leading by example? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Armstrong's comments in uh, respect of uh, the Labour Party are a matter for him, and I do not intend to uh, respond to them here in this meeting this afternoon. Uh, in respect of the target that was set of, uh, of 2015, um, the previous administration had done little towards meeting that target. So when we took office, we took a view on it. It was not possible to achieve uh, the target because of the lack of progress by the previous administration. To come to a substantive point, the City Council will be doing more to move towards an electrified fleet and taking the carbon out of its, uh, its transport vehicles as we move forward. But as we're all aware, this is a huge challenge the route to zero. It is not just a challenge for Birmingham City Council. It is a national challenge. Indeed, it is a challenge to the entire world. That is why world leaders are currently meeting at the COP26 summit in the city of Glasgow at the moment. If we are going to move in the direction of zero carbon and take carbon out of the transport system in this city, we are going to need the support and the funding of the national government. I'm sorry to say that that uh, support and funding is not currently forthcoming, so we are hamstrung in our efforts to uh, um, move more quickly to take carbon out of the transport system. However, I remain hopeful, in spite of the fact that the COP26 uh, summit did not make the best of starts with a number of people from around the world flying in by private jet, I remain optimistic that coming out of that summit will be some concrete proposals to take carbon out of not only transport but uh, also out of buildings and move us towards uh, zero, a zero carbon economy in the future. But the government will need to rise to that challenge. Thank you. Councillor John Hurt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Council, and perhaps I can follow up that last series of questions as I wanted to ask the Leader too about our response to, to climate change. Um, and I'm just noting his comments in response to that last question, which appear to suggest the City is unable to meet its targets, which we set as a climate emergency to achieve zero carbon by 2030 uh, without um, external and even possibly international support. Now, let me put it to the leader that as a city council, we declared a climate emergency and we set an objective of 2030 to achieve zero carbon. Does he now think the city council is incapable of achieving that objective? Thank you, Lord Mayor. The uh, target that we have set is to um, be carbon neutral by uh, 2030 or as soon thereafter as a just transition will allow. What we are not prepared to do is to 
further impoverish already deprived communities in the city in order to uh, get to uh, carbon neutral by 2030. So, as I said earlier, this is not just a challenge for the City Council. This is a national and international challenge. I remain optimistic that at the COP26 uh, summit that's currently uh, going on in Glasgow, there will be some progress made and that that progress will then cause the uh, British government to recognise that if we are going to get to uh, carbon neutrality by 2030, they need to provide the, the tools and the funding to allow local authorities to achieve that. This is not a journey that can be undertaken by Whitehall alone. This is not going to be achieved if there is a Whitehall knows best approach to this. So the government have to recognise that taking carbon out of the economy needs to be done close to where people live, where they uh, work and where they take their leisure. And that means empowering local authorities. If I may, Lord Mayor, um, and th thank you for that answer. And I'm, I'm in considerable sympathy with, with, with much of that. Um, but the leader talks about empowering local authorities. He also talks about potentially impoverishing communities by moving towards climate change. So I, I'd ask him about the impact on our local communities, because it seems to me there's a choice, and he needs to tell us in what way does he think that moving to climate uh, carbon zero in, could impoverish local communities, and could we perhaps do better at galvanising our local communities to get behind uh, tackling this, this real and very serious menace of global warming. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. The, uh, the obvious challenge of uh, tackling climate change and, and moving to zero carbon is one of cost. Uh, the costs of changing the way we live our lives, the costs of changing the way we move around this city, and the costs of changing the way we work uh, have to be shared out fairly in order to make a just transition. So that is what I mean when I say that we have to ensure that we do not impoverish or further impoverish already deprived communities in uh, the city. This change has got to be done in a, uh, a fair way. And I note that uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrat Party uh, in this city, as in the past, opposed measures, some of them difficult decisions that the council has had to take in order to nudge and encourage people to move around this city in a different way. I think it's something like 27 to 30% of uh, carbon emissions in the city are caused by transport. If we're going to tackle that issue, then we have to get people out of the private car and into sustainable forms of transport and uh, into public transport. What that means, Councillor Hunt, is that when we squeeze space for the car on the highway network, you need to be supporting us in that in order that we can make progress towards carbon neutrality by 2030. And the opposition that you've made in the past, two measures that uh, allocate more space to cycling, walking and public transport and less place, space to cars, are, I'm afraid, doing this city a disservice in its journey to carbon neutrality. Councillor Julian Pritchard. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is to the leader of the council, uh, Councillor Ian Ward. Um, and does the leader think that going to court is a satisfactory way to resolve the situation currently in Saxelby House and Druids Heath with the one remaining resident not moved because he feels he has not been offered alternative accommodation suitable to his needs? Um, what is he doing to resolve this situation without the need to, to take this individual to court? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. It is very much regrettable that uh, the situation at Druid's Heath has uh, resulted in the City Council having to take legal action. Um, what we uh, cannot do is breach our own housing policy in order to accommodate one individual. It's never good to make policy on the basis of one 
particular case, and uh, that applies here. What we are doing uh, in order to help with the current situation is that the current offer that's been made to the individual concerned will remain on the table. We have made a number of reasonable offers to the individual. The problem is that the person concerned does not accept uh, the uh, policy position of the City Council and does not, has not been uh, therefore in a position to accept any of the quite a number of offers in actual fact that have been made to rehouse him. Yes, Lord, Lord Mayor. Um, this case is not the only uh, problematic case that um, housing clearance case that I've uh, dealt with in Dredge as part of the rehousing process. Um, there's been lots of cases of people being moved into accommodation that just wasn't fit for purpose um, and the kind of process people have found quite difficult um, and what they're being offered and only having a certain number of refusals and it is actually you know the council that wants their property um, which is a slightly different dynamic to um, most people on the housing register um, so in light of these difficulties and a lot of these issues that have happened with um, the clearance process um, do, would he consider reviewing the housing clearance policy Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. There's always uh, comes a time when we might review uh, policies. Um, I don't think uh, we need to review our, our policy in respect to what's happened at Druid's Heath, but let me, let me be frank about what has happened there. I think that um, initially uh, the City Council painted a vision to uh, the people of, of Druid's Heath that, uh, in truth, the City Council couldn't deliver upon. Since then, I have personally attended a number of meetings uh, out in Durrits Heath to speak uh, to the people there. Uh, I've pointed out to them at those meetings the amount of money the City Council had in order to uh, provide housing renewal at this particular location. And if the ambition of the local community was greater than that, then we would need to find a way of levering in additional resource. Now, as it happened, the local community expressed the wish that they would want to see additional resource uh, leave it in to, uh, to improve what was being offered at Druin's Heath. And we have listened to that uh, and therefore have taken those issues on board and are now seeking to broaden out the remit for that particular housing renewal. The people who uh, are the, the subject of... Uh, properties that are being demolished and therefore have to be rehoused. Also made representation about having a right to return. Now we weren't in a position to offer an absolute right of return, but nonetheless we again responded to that by bringing forward an option to return. And as I understand it, all of the uh, residents in Druid's Heath who are subject to rehousing, uh, it is very, very likely that they will be offered the opportunity to be rehoused back into, uh, into Druid's Heath. So I I think the City Council have listened. I think the City Council have been very reasonable in its approach to this community and we'll continue to work with the community to improve the properties in that part of Birmingham. Thank you. My next speaker is Captain Haru. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is addressed to the Leader of the Council, Councillor Ian Ward. Having been a regular attendee at the Kings Heath Low Traffic Neighbourhood meetings for officers and councillors, it has become clear to me that we need to reduce the amount of traffic on our roads, especially at school drop-off and pick-up times. We need to encourage our children and young people to use the buses, as well as encouraging them to walk and to cycle to school. I strongly believe that offering free bus travel to our children and young people would reduce traffic and would create a culture in Birmingham that using public transport is the norm, as well as improving our air quality. Please can you let us know whether you would support providing our children and young people with free bus travel to school, alternatively, or as well as, could a school bus service be introduced to transport our children from their home areas to school? Thank you.
Thank you, Lord Mayor. As well as being our most vulnerable road users, children are the commuters of the future. And the need to establish the right kind of travel habits and knowledge from an early age. The Birmingham Transport Plan recognises the importance of this and also the need to break the link between driving children to school and Oddwood commutes. That is, is having to drive to work because you have to drive the kids to school and vice versa. Officers from the trans Travel Demand Team are currently engaged with hundreds of schools right across the city to encourage and enable more sustainable trips to school. This involves travel planning, cycle training, road safety measures outside schools and providing funding for improved cycle parking at schools. Improved cycling facilities such as segregated lanes are being introduced across the city as part of our active travel fund programme and since 2019 we've introduced 12 car free school streets at Birmingham schools with a further six planned for the spring of next year. This program involves closing the road to motor vehicles outside the school gates at drop-off and pick-up times in order to improve safety, but also to encourage more parents to take their children to and from school in a more sustainable manner. Turning to the issue of uh, free travel, free bus travel for school-aged children, this is something that I uh, very much would want to support. However, it would come at considerable cost to uh, the public purse. So I do believe this is something that needs to be promoted nationally and they are more than happy to begin lobbying the government uh, about this. It is also perhaps something that ought to be on the agenda at the COP26 summit currently uh, taking place. And as I said earlier, I am optimistic that that summit will have a, a positive outcome and perhaps that will afford us the opportunity to speak to the British government after the summit about how we might move towards providing free bus travel for all school-aged children, not just in Birmingham, but right throughout the country. Yes, Lord Mayor, thank you. Uh, what else do you think could be done to encourage more children to walk and cycle to school? I know some local schools I've spoken to have been trying to incentivise their children to walk to school by offering free breakfast and things like that. Have you got any other ideas? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I think the more we can do to uh, encourage parents um, to um, change their, their, their habits about dropping off uh, children um, at school and picking them up at the end of the school day, uh, it, the more we can do in that direction, the better. Uh, one of the problems, uh, of course, with the, um, with the drop-off uh, and pick-up is the congestion that it causes uh, right across the city. And that's noticeable uh, during uh, school holiday times when it becomes uh, easier to travel around the city than it is uh, when, uh, when the schools are actually in. So the more we can do to encourage parents to encourage their children to walk and cycle to school, uh, the better. And I think the City Council so as part of that deal needs to be investing more in sustainable forms of travel. So we need to be investing more in cycle lanes that are genuinely segregated from the highway, otherwise it's not safe and it's certainly not safe uh, for children and young people to be cycling. So more investment in that, more investment uh, in walking and I think then if we can join with parents and in return for that investment, parents themselves are nudged into different habits and more sustainable uh, methods of transport, then we will be moving towards that zero carbon city and zero carbon transport that Councillor Hunt was expressing a desire for earlier. Thank you. The next question is from Councillor Zaka Chaudhry. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is to the leader. Commonwealth Gram will be in our city on 28th July, just under nine months away. Given the current state of the city is in, litter, fly tipping, graffiti, potholes, black gullies, everything is on increase, and parks are in terrible state. Is he confident that he will be able to deliver the Commonwealth Games. Much, uh, Lord Mayor. Yes, I am very, very confident that not only will the City of Birmingham deliver the Commonwealth Games, we will deliver the Commonwealth Games with 
extreme success and I'm happy to explain why I think that. I think we're going to deliver a Commonwealth Games that the nation and the Commonwealth will be proud of because the people of this city are capable of hosting this event in a way that it's never ever been hosted before and we are going to see during the Commonwealth Games the very best of Birmingham and the very best of the people of Birmingham. And what I would say uh, to, to, to the councillor is that you need to have a little more confidence in our people and Brummies because, as I've said, <laughs> we will, on the 28th of July next year, open a Commonwealth Games the like of which the Commonwealth has never seen before. And I hope that you will join with me on that occasion in celebrating the success of the people of Birmingham, not only in the opening ceremony, but the whole of the 11 days of sport that we'll have in this city. As to uh, the condition of the city, we have invested over £7 million in ensuring that there's going to be a clean-up right across Birmingham in time for the Commonwealth Games. We've entered a partnership with Keep Britain Tidy in order to highlight to people the damage that dropping litter and fly tipping causes uh, across the city. And uh, we are working with the people of Birmingham in order to clean up our city, not just for the Games, but for the future and for future generations. And I repeat, please... Join with me and have a little more confidence in the people of Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The leader and his team was so confident in South Yardley East, and look what happened. What measures will you take to ensure the increase of beggars on our streets? They are not normal beggars, they are professional beggars. And we have a lot of them in, scattered in Birmingham. What measures are you going to take to bring our city back to normal and that re reputation our city deserves? Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I didn't understand the first comment about, um, about Yardley, but n n nonetheless, let me say something about people who are, are begging uh, in the city. First of all, uh, I think we have to uh, take a balanced approach to this. There are people in this city who are homeless and without an income. And what we have to do is ensure that we are providing the wraparound support that those people need to get back on their feet. So I don't think we should be entering into some blanket condemnation of everyone we find out on the streets. I think that would be absolutely wrong. However, I do think there is an issue about human trafficking and modern day slavery and that we need to tackle head on and we need to get to the root of the cause of that which are the people who are doing the trafficking and subjecting people to modern slavery and we are working with the Police and Crime Commissioner and the Chief Constable about measures that we can bring forward to tackle uh, human trafficking and modern slavery and if that is uh, taking place uh, amongst the people who find themselves out on the streets in, in this city, then we will work with those victims, because they are victims, please do understand that, in order that we can get to the real criminals behind this trade. Councillor Mackey, this is the last question on this section. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. My question is to Bridget Jones, Deputy Leader of the Council. Four and a half years ago, the Birmingham Mail ran a headline saying the Council was addicted to secrecy. Four years on, we are seeing uh, the Council block access to a report uh, requested by motion by councillors, information denied to the Audit Committee, long delays in answering freedom of information requests, and information posted to the, in, to the transparency website, ignoring national guidance on the sign-off of exit packages with over £100,000, nearly £1 million paid off in so-called gagging clauses. When is the Council going to finally start matching words with actions on its commitment to openness and transparency? Thank 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you to Councillor Mackey for your question. Uh, when I first joined the Cabinet, we'd inherited a culture from the previous administration where around about half the reports for every meeting turned up late, allowing little time for public scrutiny or any scrutiny on them, and almost all of them came with a private appendix, a very lengthy private appendix attached. That's the culture that we inherited when, we, when I first joined. As you'll have seen from sitting around the Cabinet table, through robust challenge on that, we have now got down to a point where it's a minority of reports that come with any private appendix, and it is, a, it is scant information, only that, that is very, very necessary that is in there. And that is due to repeated robust challenge from myself and other members of officers on that. When it comes to some of the other um, things that you've mentioned, where the Councillor Mackey has mentioned, I share your frustration. But sadly, I am not above the law uh, and I am not above uh, some of the agreements that are made um, and, and neither, neither sadly are you. And when, when it comes to the revealing of information, we are servants to, to the laws that are set above us. So whilst we work within that framework to, to put what we can in front of the people of Birmingham, there are times when sadly, to my frustration as well, that is just not legally possible. And if we want that changed, I'm afraid it's a higher house than us that we have to refer that to. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Any supplementary? Yeah, I do indeed. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. In September, um, uh, the Waitman's report was commissioned uh, after a full council passed a motion asking for an independent review into the way the safeguarding of our children was being neglected. Will you today com uh, commit to publish the redacted report and publish the full report unredacted once any court cases are completed. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so, again, there are sometimes times where we have to withhold information for certain reasons. Where there are ongoing investigations, uh, that is one of them. At the appropriate time, any information that is appropriate to be released should be released, and I can certainly commit to that. Uh, but it comes down to uh, what is appropriate and what is the, the right time to do that. Um, like yourself, Councillor Mackey, I believe in full transparency uh, when it comes to the pub to, when it comes to uh, council business and full transparency with the public. Um, but there is sometimes a time and a place for that, and as you will be well aware, there are often reasons for that timing. But at the appropriate time, the appropriate information should always be released, and that's my commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on to item number seven, appointments by the council. Are there any nomination? First, Council Martin Sticker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have one change to propose to the City Council. Councillor Mike Leddy to replace Councillor Mick Brown on the Sustainability and Transport Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Agreed. Thank you. Councillor Gersmo. Councillor Mike Ward. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We have vacancies on some committees to fill, and I propose that, uh, that I myself join Licensing and Public Protection Committee, Licensing Subcommittee C, and the Standards Committee, and that Councillor Paul Tilsley joins Warwickshire County Cricket Club Safety Advisory Group. I propose those, Lord Mayor. Is that agreed? Thank you. Thank you. Now we move on to item number eight. We will now receive a report of the Cabinet giving an update on the health and social care, education, skills and culture, cabinet members' portfolio, together with an update on special education needs and disabilities, and the home to school transport service. The time for this item is 25 minutes. I have a list of speakers for this item. Could I ask those of you who want to speak but are not on the list to raise your hand, and I will call you if there is a time I call upon Councillor Pollard Hamilton to move the motion, please. Mm -hmm. 
Right, thank you, Lord Mayor. I stand today to move the motion of the Executive Business Report. Can I start by saying I'll be going through um, some of what um, health and the wellbeing portfolio has been doing, but Councillor Sharon Thompson will also stand to speak relating to education, skills, culture, and also issues around home to school transport or what we have been doing. What a year it has been for the whole of Cabinet. We are emerging from a pandemic that although we still have many concerns, our hospitals are operating at a level of pressure normally only seen in the depth of the winter. This is impacting on our workers who support the acute sector, early intervention services and our providers. The report before you today sets out some of the great work of our frontline staff who do an incredible job in keeping our citizens safe and well. It also sets out the challenges we are facing as we respond to demands of the services. We are facing unprecedented demand in recruiting and in retaining enough workforce to deliver our statutory duties and are relying far more that we than we would like to on agency staff. I'd also like to say we are also seeing pressures on the care market, which is struggling to cope at the moment. We are working hard to support our care homes and all our providers. This is coupled with all our care staff being mandated to have COVID vaccinations, which is putting pressures on staffing levels and the availability of our care staff. But as per usual, Birmingham City Council, the local NHS and others are working closely to support our care homes in this area. I was really pleased to take part in the recent pause and learn review of adult social care that was carried out by ADAS in July this year. And the commitment and passion to focus on prevention and early intervention was visible during that, re um, during that review. Also, the consistent messages that prevention matters had, has had a significant impact. Can I also say, continuing to implement the customer journey and strength-based model shaped um, has helped us to respond to the post-pandemic challenges, including those that have been faced by our diverse and mobile populations. In terms of performance, adult social care continues to support citizens and to take control over how, they, how support is provided. Can I now talk a little bit about public health? Public health has been magnificent in the last year. But the Public Health Division has been working on refreshing our health and wellbeing strategy and creating a healthier city. The strategy currently is out for consultation until the 10th of September. Also, we've looked at creating a healthier food city. A wide range of work is underway on this particular agenda. It's something that I'm actually really passionate about. The creating of the Healthy Food City Forum is in the process of developing a food strategy for the city. Can I also say many of you have been involved in our Future Parks Accelerator programme, which has continued to highlight the benefits of green spaces within the city, especially during COVID-19, where those 571 parks, as well as, as all our streets, have become so valuable for people to walk and to do other things, well, to walk and run. COVID-19 has showed just how important green space and nature um, are to people. 
Improvements have already been seen and how residents engage in green space across the three pilot sites which also improves mental well-being. COVID-19 is still with us and many of us will soon be receiving our booster vaccinations. As you know, I tell all of you I'm 21 and a half, but I've just had my booster. So I was just very young when I had my booster. So it is important on a serious note that if you're called for your boosters, please go and get it. It is important that if you're called for your flu jab, please ensure that you uh, go and get the flu jab because ahead of, of us is a tough winter and we need to ensure that we keep ourselves protected but we keep the city protected and before I finish can I just add that there is an amendment that has been put forward can I say that as um, someone proposing this motion we will be rejecting this amendment because to be honest there have been many opportunities to discuss the issues relating to home to school transport and send so I will not say any more at this point, and I will say thank you, Lord Mayor, and I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon Councillor Sharon Thompson to second. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and um, thank, thank you, um, Councillor Hamilton, for. Um, for uh, moving the motion and just to thank you for all your hard work that you've done over the pandemic as well when it comes to your portfolio because it's been phenomenal and with the city has really got through a lot through that assistance. Lord Mayor, since um, being appointed to cabinet, as cabinet member for Vulnerable Children and Families portfolio in August, it's fair to say it's been it's been a busy few months getting to grip with a wide portfolio, but what has been evident is that there's been a lot of support from staff across the city. Um, and I would just like to thank all of the staff in the Children's Trust and also in Birmingham City Council who work across the portfolio, and that includes the two chief executives, one from Birmingham City Council and one from Birmingham um, Children's Trust, for their continuous commitment to our children across the city. There's been regular briefings that have currently been given, in, not just in terms of SEND and our home to school transport service, but also our Children's Trust. And last week, Ofsted carried out an inspection of our Birmingham Children's Trust, and I had the opportunity to meet with the lead inspector. And we will receive the letter from Ofsted at the end of the week, or early next week, um, and I will share that the outcome with the Chamber. Our Children's Trust, the Council and all our partners, are responsible as corporate parents for our children and young people and what we do what we do must and what we say we must be striving towards is the best corporate parents that we can be the trust is doing a great job with a great family ethos as birmingham's biggest family over the summer we ran a holiday activity program and the, part, the participa participation level and activities were absolutely phenomenal in terms of the numbers and we will continue to build on this over the Christmas break to ensure the children we are collectively responsible for have fun activities that support their well-being and resilience. There's a lot of positive work that's taking place but we do have significant challenges and some of those challenges are around recruitment and retention and placement sufficiency and all of which place pressure on finances but it's clear that the focus continues of improving quality for our practice and to deliver value for money for our children across the city. Lord Mayor, moving on to our SEND services, as I've um, previously shared with our colleagues, the RISE Forum would prefer us to use the term for the services as can children with additional needs, which we've started to do whenever, we, whenever it is possible, and we will need to use SEND where it is currently required under the Code of Practice and as a requirement by F the DFA. Lord Mayor, I regularly meet with parents and, and have an appreciation for the Parent Care Forum, who do an incredibly, incredible job in, in representing families and carers and supporting us in that much needed recovery and improvements. Lord Mayor, I'm, I'm aware that there was um, an amendment that has been made 
around um, an emergency meeting that um, some of the colleagues in the room wanted to take place. And Lord Mayor, it's not a cabinet decision, but your decision that you turned down that meeting. Lord Mayor, I have to say there's been ample opportunity for colleagues to discuss SEND, as Councillor Hamilton has said. And since being in post, I myself have seen two scrutinies. There's been um, task and finish groups, which has been chaired by the leader. And we haven't seen any motions come forward in terms of um, this area, but there's been ample opportunities for us to discuss since we have been, um, since, since at least I've been in post. I'm not standing here today saying that all is well. Oh, oh that went quick. <laughs> Lord Mayor, I think I best finish off by saying Councillor Francis also wanted to um, speak up on her um, portfolio, and she wants to send a big thank you to. Um, the education, skills and current um, and culture portfolio staff who have been working well over the course of time and they have supported so many children and um, culture events across the city including for women, Black History Month and many other things and I shall leave it there Lord Mayor. Thank you. I have one amendment and uh, therefore I call upon Councillor Maureen Carnage to move the amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I rise briefly to discuss the appendix to this report, giving an update on SEND services, a matter outside this portfolio, but an important one nonetheless. Lord Mayor, it is unfortunate that you did not agree with the three opposition parties that a failing service responsible for so many highly vulnerable children that has reached such a crisis point that the government have had to send in an external commissioner to take over. It was significant or urgent, and was it significant or urgent enough to warrant granting the request for a specially requisitioned extraordinary council meeting to debate this issue properly? Of course, you may have felt, Lord Mayor, that the need for external interventions for Birmingham City Council under Labour control has become so regular and routine that it isn't something extraordinary at all. Though I certainly know of no other local authority where that would be the case. Whatever your reasons, Lord Mayor, it is of course your prerogative and we respect the office of the Lord Mayor and its powers. What is not acceptable, however, is for the Council to then frustrate attempts by those opposition, opposition councillors to exercise their democratic right to requisition such a meeting themselves. What is not acceptable is for the leader to close down debate at Cabinet and refuse reasonable requests at CBM for more transparency. What is not acceptable is to believe that sneaking an update on this service into the appendix of another portfolio update that itself has only been alloc allocated 25 minutes is, an in is sort of a substitute for full open and democratic debate. The public must be wondering, Lord Mayor, what exactly it is that the leader of this council is scared of. We could, of course, choose to take up more of this debate on adult social care to discuss children's special education needs, or even move an amendment to that effect. However, to do so would mean the focus is drawn away from another important subject, social care to give, still insufficient time to discuss children's special education need. This, that is a disservice to all those who rely on both these services and is not something any councillor sat in this room should be content with. The council claims it is committed to openness and transparency. Indeed, it even repeats that point within this very report and yet its actions so far removed from its words on transparency. It has lost any semblance of credibility. Lord Mayor, we have been saying for some time now that the Council faced a mountain to climb in rebuilding trust with SEND parents after years of failure and broken promises. Trust comes without 
Trust cannot come without transparency and accountability, and this administration attempts to continually evade the above, threatened to the fat fatality undermine any genuine attempts at transformation before they can even begin and lead to a complete lack of faith that any sustainable improvements can be made without a change in political leaderships. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I hope that, if nothing else, that at least every reasonable Labour councillor makes clear to their leader that this high-handed approach is damaging not only to improvement aspirations in this vital area, but also more generally to public perception of local democracy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Now I call upon Peter Fowler to second the amendment, please. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. I rise to second the amendment. As my uh, colleague said, in order not to take up any more time on this important, important issue, I have nothing really further to add other than to say, Lord Mayor, it is such a great shame that councillors have not been afforded the opportunity today to debate the SEN crisis in full. It is very disappointing, Lord Mayor, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much. There is only time for one speaker. I call upon Councillor Mary Lock. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, over the last 20 months, so much has been achieved by Birmingham City Council. Key workers across both public and private sector deserve our heartfelt thanks and appreciation. A derisory pay rise for NHS staff and, NH and public, other public sector workers uh, has been given with also a slap of the national insurance increase next year from a government who only enrich their friends and backers with contracts for PPE, etc. I wish to mention the work of the neighbourhood network schemes in, in my area, Selly Oak, which were given, or, grants were given to organisations for such things as introductions for computers, remote, a lady, a lady in my ward who's 80 learned how to shop and bank online and it opened up a new world for her. She can't get over it because um, she was isolating at the time. I also wish to mention Pioneer Places. Well, my ward is one. Local community groups got together to decide how to spend a further um, an allocation of money. It was decided to purchase cooking equipment and crockery and cutlery uh, to assist those in need. I think also as Cabinet Advisor for Carers, the hidden army of thousands of carers across our city who have perhaps had to work from home, maybe had to combine it with homeschooling plus caring for loved ones. The many BBC Birmingham City Council uh, staff who are carers who meet each week to have a chat for an hour via Teams. I wish to personally thank all residential and care home staff who, whilst families were prevented from visiting loved ones, and they did so much to reassure us when all we could do was talk to our relatives by, via Zoom. This is just a little of what has been done during the pandemic. There was so much more across the whole of our city by community groups, faith groups, and many, many more. Thank you, Lord Mayor. As we have got only 25 minutes, we haven't got any time for any more speakers. So therefore, I call upon Councillor Hamilton to reply.
Thank you, Lord Mayor. I can never get this thing off, oh dear Lord. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I start by saying, um, Councillor Cornish, I've heard your, your words and I'm saddened because we have a leadership, we have authority within this council. Now, if half of what you said was actually needed and you wanted it, why wasn't it sorted out at business management so that it could be brought to this forum? Saying it on the day is unfortunately, it's not the way to do things. So I'm just saying to you, if we want to get things done, let's follow the process that we ourselves, as a as a, a group of councillors and cabinet have put in place just so that we can get things done in the right and proper way. Just to clarify, I'm sure the cabinet member would wish to clarify her comments yeah. there. She said it was uh, never raised anywhere else. It was clearly raised in advance of the September meeting, indeed asked for an item, and the leader refused to have it on the September council meeting. Then a letter was sent to the Lord Mayor asking for a requisition for meeting. Again, that was refused. Following the constitution, then a following a follow-up requisition, which is allowed, was also asked for. That was refused. So it's been asked for many times, Cabinet Member. You're very wrong to say it hasn't been. I think you have a point, yes. yes. Can you have a question for the I don't often get into these debates, but it doesn't mean it's done the right way because... Um, <laughs> it, no, I'm not going to. Robert, you know I'm the first person to admit I was wrong. But something, if the Lord Mayor has said he doesn't want a process, he has got ultimate authority here. And we have gone on and claims have been made by Councillor Cornish, which I have to say, in defence of the Cabinet member and the team that have been dealing with it, it's not fair, and I'm saying it publicly. So let me just get on with closing this report. Can I also say, because um, Councillor Thompson didn't have time to say this, that we do have a commissioner that's been appointed from the Department of Education and the commissioner is called John, um, I think it's Clouthen, I may have got that wrong, I'm hopeless with names, to hold the local area to account in the required SEND improvements. I've been told this is an excellent man, he has no axe to, to grind and he's really willing to work with Birmingham to make the improvements that we want. I've also been told on good authority, Councillor um, Thompson, that there is an improvement board meeting that is being chaired by the Commissioner that will take place tomorrow on the 3rd of November. And, and the terms of reference and the accelerated pro, um, progress plan will be considered for approval. The board will have cross-party representation. Can I just say to her end... This report, I have to thank Councillor Thompson's team and Councillor Francis because they have worked really hard and we really haven't had enough time to give all three portfolios the earring they've needed after all the hard work they've done. But what we have done is try to give you a taste at this um, lectern to ensure that you know that we're working hard for the citizens of Birmingham. Lord Mayor, thank you very much and I will take my seat. We will now vote on the amendment proposed by Councillor Maureen Cornish and seconded by Councillor Peter Fawcett. All those in favour? All those against? Yes. Amendment is lost. Nice. Okay, the officers will call the names. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, councillors. I will go through the list of names and I will also call out the names of all those councillors who have given apologies just to ensure that I don't inadvertently miss anyone during the roll call. So, Councillor Ahmed. Against. Councillor Aklak, Councillor Aitken and Councillor Akhtar have all given apologies. 
Councillor Deirdre Alden. Councillor Robert Alden. Councillor Ali. Councillor Ali. Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Atwall have both given apologies. Councillor Azim. Sorry. Against. That's Councillor Azim against. Councillor Barry. Apologies. Councillor Baz. Councillor Beecham. Councillor Bennett. Councillor Booth. Councillor Bohr. Councillor Brenham. Councillor Bridal. Councillor Brown. Councillor Chatfield. Councillor Chowdhury. Councillor Clancy. Councillor Clements. Councillor Cornish. Councillor John Cotton has given apologies. Councillor Davis. Councillor Delaney. Councillor Donaldson. Councillor Dring and Councillor Fazel have given apologies. Councillor Fowler. Councillor Jane Francis has given apologies. Councillor Freeman. Councillor Peter Griffiths has given apologies. Councillor Gridrod. Yes. Councillor Hamilton. Yes. Councillor Harmer. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Hartley has given apologies. Yes. Councillor Higgs. Yes. Councillor Holivara. Yes. Councillor Holbrook. Yes. Councillor Hunt. Councillor Mahmood Hussein. Yes. Councillor Sabrine Hussein has given apologies. Councillor Huxtable. Yes. Councillor Idris. Yes. Councillor Iqbal has given apologies. Councillor Iroh. Yes. Councillor Islam. Yes. Councillor Jan. Yes. Councillor Marion Jenkins. Yes. Councillor Kerry Jenkins has given apologies, as has Councillor. Johnson White, Councillor Josh Jones, Apologies. Councillor Bridget Jones, okay. Councillor Corsa, okay. Councillor Miriam Khan, okay. Councillor Zahir Khan has given apologies, Councillor Kuna, yeah. Councillor Lal, yeah. Councillor Mike Lady has given apologies, Councillor Bruce Lines, oh. Councillor John Lines, Councillor Locke. Yes. Councillor Mackey. Yes. Councillor Mahmood. Yes. Councillor Malik. Yes. Councillor McCarthy. Yes. Councillor Sidi Mayor has given apologies. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Morell. Yes. Councillor Mosquito. Councillor Mosquito. No. Councillor O'Reilly. Councillor O'Shea, okay. Councillor Piers, Pear, sorry, big pardon. Oh. Councillor Pocock, okay. Councillor Pritchard, oh. Councillor Quinnan and Councillor Rashid have both given apologies. Councillor Rice, okay. Councillor Sandbrook, okay. Councillor Sandu, oh. Councillor Scott, Councillor Shah. Yeah. Again, is that against? Yeah. If there's any out there, they can. Because there was no alarm, so therefore we can include them if they have come back and they are voting yes or no. Lord, 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 Lord. 
Which one will be? Shall I, can, I continue then we can twine it? Okay, carry on, please. Well, I'll, do, I'll continue with the outstanding names then. Uh, Councillor Sharp. Yeah. Councillor Spence. Yeah. Councillor Stanford. Yeah. Councillor Stora. Yeah. Councillor Straker Wilds. Yeah. Councillor Solman. Yeah. Councillor Thompson. Yeah. Councillor Tilsley. Yeah. Councillor Trickett. Yeah. Councillor Ian Ward. Yeah. Councillor Mike Ward. Councillor Webb. Apologies. Councillor Wood. Councillor Yip. And Councillor Zaffer has given apologies. Do you want me to be that? Should I hear? I don't know the answer. Yes. Councillor Rice, you've. Councillor Rice, So if I go, Councillor Rice? Yeah. Councillor Mosquito? Anyone, anyone who has not been called? So everyone who is inside, they have been called, yes. Yeah, yeah. The result is 31 for, 36 against, so amendment is lost. Not this time. We will now move on on the recommendation. All those in favor? All those in favor of recommendation? Okay. All those against? Recommendation is carried. Thank you. We move on to the next item. We will now receive a report from the Vice Chair of the Investment and Combined Authorities, Overview and Security Committee on the work of the committee. The time for this item is 20 minutes. Could I ask those of you who want to speak but are not on the list to raise your hands, and I will call you if there is a time. I call upon Councillor Lisa Tricker to move the recommendation. Thank Close. you. Thank you, 
Lord Mayor, thank you colleagues. Um, I rise as Birmingham's lead uh, member to the West Midlands Combined Authority Overview and Scrutiny. Um, in a year where we've seen lives and livelihoods abruptly lost, the issue of what happens at the Combined Authority, indeed scrutiny as a whole, can seem as a very distant thing, a very unnecessary dis deflection from some of the urgent business we have. What I would contend, and I think what we increasingly find out, that actually there is no more time that actually taking time out to reflect, pause and consider the most appropriate policy response is actually within a crisis, and it's within a crisis the importance of scrutiny becomes live. What I'd also like to uh, reflect upon that as a combined authority, it is a sphere of governance that links both this as Birmingham local authority to the national government and indeed has the capacity to influence the economy, the transport, the lives and livelihoods of the people we represent in this city and very much as the part, a member of the Birmingham team on the Scrutiny Committee, we see our role very much to reflect the concerns and challenges of the citizens that we represent, both within Birmingham and the wider conurbation. Importantly also, we see ourselves as members who reflect the lived experience. As we see more and more employment patterns changing and maybe senior officers not being resident within our local authorities, it becomes more and more critical. The lived experience of members, the understanding we hold of local communities is truly fed into the policy and overview process. And again, for that reason, I commend scrutiny and also the importance that scrutiny and certainly the West Midlands Combined Overview scrutiny have placed on considering evidence. One of the key issues for us in the last two years has really been, I suppose, um, if I was to give you a shorthand, was are the policies, are the investments actually making any difference to the people's lives who I represent, you represent, the people I care for? the people we all care for. And I think what we would need to reflect that, um, in, and in line with the government's levelling up agenda, the combined authority has actually got some way to go. And it doesn't matter whether you call it inclusive growth, whether you call it levelling up, building back better, we still have a shameful gap between the communities who are actually able to secure wealth in this region and those who have little. If we were to give an example, one of the areas that we have considered is the whole area of inclusive growth. And it remains a concern to us that a point in time that the uh, combined authority in the region was seeing growth, that actually we didn't see an increase in the jobs available and the jobs that were appropriate for the citizens in this city and region. Particularly, the black country and Birmingham did not see a change in their lived experience and indeed they saw deprivation levels and poverty increase. In a period where the combined authority could be celebrating housing numbers and the amount of houses it built, we actually saw a fall in the number of affordable housing units that were built by the combined authority, by, with the support of the combined authority, at a time when in this city and other uh, towns and cities in this region, bed and breakfast was going through the roof. In this city and across the region, we still also live with a horror that we've lived with for 20, 30 years possibly, that where you live, where you were born and where you work actually determines how long you live. And that sheer breadth of inequality in health and experience in our region is very much something that we talk about, but we have to collectively own we're less good at succeeding in. And for me, partly what we have tried to challenge the combined authority to look at is measures of success. And whilst appreciating we've been in an election year, can I just say, you cannot measure success by cranes in the sky. 
nor can you measure success in the opportunities you have to wear a hard hat and high-vis jacket. Neither can you measure success in the amount of opportunities you seek to have a ribbon to cut. Success has to be measured in the difference it actually makes for every child, every family and every business in this region. And one thing that across party we have said is the measures of success for the combined authority need to be reviewed. As an example, I will reflect on um, areas that we looked at this year. It also included the, um, quite apt at this point in time, um, the zero carbon future and the combined authorities 2041 uh, strategy. And very much we hear the words of, we're going to be home of the industrial green revolution. What does that mean in reality? What does this mean to the, se what sectors are we actually going to seek to intervene in? What areas are we going to support? What jobs are going to go? What jobs are going to grow? What jobs will require intensive support and transition? 22,000 jobs are due to go in Yardley, Erdington, Wolverhampton South East and West Brom West alone if we do not move forward on actually addressing properly transition. This is not something that can be left to chance. This is not something that can be left to the market. It requires a planned, measured, coherent, fair transition with government, region, local authority, city, town, neighbourhood, moving forward. To conclude, I think it's really important that we continue, the work of scrutiny does continue and that the voices of members are heard in any policy development process. I would like to particularly thank uh, Deb Cadman for when she was Chief Exec of the um, Combined Authority for the support she gave to the scrutiny process and the Sound Council. She gave through a fairly difficult year. I'd also like to thank Team Birmingham, Peter and Liz for the extraordinary support they give freely and the time they give and the depth of inquiry they bring to the scrutiny process. Thank you, colleagues. I move the report. Is that seconded? Is that formally seconded? Agreed. As we are running late, so there is only space for two speakers. I first call upon <clears throat> Councillor Bridget John. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and um, can I start by thanking Councillor Trickett for, for all of the um, work that she has led on in scrutiny over the last um, year or so, uh, and also to Councillors um, Fowler and uh, Clements on, on the committees as well, and also to uh, Kath, um, Kath Hartley, who we heard from at our last uh, Council meeting for her work uh, at CA2. Uh, there's a huge amount that goes on here. Uh, scrutiny is a vital function, as Councillor Trickett has set out, in any democratic organisation. And as the report notes, quite an unusual one in the CA, where there is only one direct, directly elected politician, uh, complemented by a series from other councils, of which I am one. Um, it's important for a whole host of reasons, but not least in calling out some of the smoke and mirrors around funding that we've seen in the last few days, with the new transport funds being announced in the budget. Repackaging old money as new is deliberately misleading, um, and the vast majority of what was announced in that funding round is, I'm afraid, old money for the West Midlands. We had a disappointing second Devo deal, and it feels like things have continued to stall, which again is something I know scrutiny has been hot on. We don't level up, as Councillor Trickett has said. We don't tackle issues such as climate change. We, we don't provide the homes and the jobs that our people need. And we don't see a serious shift in economic opportunity without a serious devolution of further powers to the CA and to the constituent authorities that sit below it, as study around study around the world has shown to us. And I know that scrutiny has been hot on the case um, of looking at this. 
In my combined authority portfolio uh, of inclusive communities, I've championed the young combined authority who are referenced in this report as well as joining in with the scrutiny sessions. And I just wanted to highlight that as they are an absolutely vital voice to have around the table as they're often affected by policies in a very different way uh, to, to us older people. Um, and hearing their voice is really key. So a thank you to scrutiny for including uh, the young combined authority in that work. Uh, while I'm on the topic of representation, I just wanted to pull up Birmingham's record on this um, because I think it's really important. Uh, so Birmingham is only one of two constituent councils of the seven to send a woman as part of its delegation to the Combined Authority Board, uh, which means that out of 15 voting members, only two are female. Uh, we're also in a minority um, to send um, female delegates to the scrutiny committee, and we've, we've um, heard we've had a um, heard from um, our fantastic one today. And I know Councillor Clements uh, was hoping to speak as well. Um, the I just wanted to highlight it because it's impossible to make the right decisions, and it's impossible to scrutinise the right decision the, the decisions well without the right representation and lived experience around that table. And I'm proud of the part that Birmingham has played on that, but I just wanted to call it out because it is not the norm at the CA table for for women to be properly represented. We do have a fantastic region, Lord Mayor, uh, full of talent and potential, but we are not reaching our potential um, at the moment, as the report has highlighted. Um, without further devolution uh, to do that and without scrutiny continuing to shine a light on what we're up to, uh, we're not going to continue to do that. So I just wanted to thank scrutiny at the CA and the Birmingham members for the work that they have played on shining a light on what the CA does over the last year. Thank them for their inclusiveness and uh, look forward to working with them uh, going forward. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. I call upon Councillor Peter Fowler. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Certainly getting some exercise today. It's gone not quite uh, one nice thing. Uh, Lord Mayor, uh, it, it's, I have to say it is an honour and a pleasure and a privilege to represent the Conservative Group on the West Midlands Combined Authority Overview and Scrutiny uh, Committee. And my sincere thanks to Councillor Jones for her very kind words and also to Councillor Trickett. Uh, the new chairman, uh, Cathy Baton, and uh, not forgetting Kath Hartley and Liz Kement, who we are now both working on the uh, air quality meetings that we have, and I find that very interesting, especially as I am a bit of an environmentalist. And I have to say, uh, Mr Mayor, that, that uh, the last meeting with the mayor, and I did mention this to, uh, to Councillor Cathy Bateman, that the uh, meeting was one of the best I think we've, I've ever sat on um, challenging the West Midlands Mayor to uh, question and answers. First of all we've worked on the air quality and especially with Councillor Ian Court on the Environmental Board how we've been reducing carbon emissions uh, with, and that's in, in line with the seven METs so my thanks to the seven METs that have been, been working with the combined authority as we head to that 2041 target, but hoping that it'll be shorter as well, especially looking at other forms of energy moving away, as we all want to, from fossil fuels. And I know that Councillor Trickett alluded to uh, affordable housing and more social housing, which I have to say, Mr Mayor, or rather Lord Mayor, that Lisa and I are, and others are certainly on, on one or as one with that, and especially as I have said with the Leader of the Council, that we as an authority need to look at a lot of the void homes that we have in Birmingham and throughout the, the West Midlands. I think that a lot of work has been done, to be fair, by Andy Street as our uh, Mayor of the West Midlands, certainly working on connectivity with the way he's been proving the uh, metro along the city centre and then out along the Hagley Road. So it's great to see that. And the rail electrif electrification is certainly one that I would like to see, but pardon the pun, we are still a bit way down the line on that. It's going to take quite a lot. But it's also equally good to see how Andy has been working with others on the Gigafactory and looking at reskilling, retraining, 
and also we're looking at HS2 and other great things like cycle hire and lots of other great uh, connectivity that is coming down the line, so to speak. And Lord Mayor, we've also got great opportunities with employment, with the economic development, the skills of improving uh, in many, many areas, and certainly the disproportionate impact that our black, Asian and minority ethnic communities that have suffered in this area. And a lot of this, of course, now we're all working busy, although people say post-COVID, Lord Mayor, we have still got a way to go um, with COVID, but we're all fighting on that battle. And finally, uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, Lord Mayor, I would still like to thank both uh, Lisa Trickett, so Councillor Trickett, and Cathy Bateman, because they know uh, when Councillor Trickett actually put forward about an environmental champion and on HS2 and energy, and she offered that position to me, and I was very grateful. I'm thoroughly enjoying that work, working with many people on a lot of things that we've talked about, or I've talked about on the West Midlands Combined Authority. And the final bit is, we know that there is still more to do, both as Birmingham City Council, the seven Mets, and obviously with the West Midlands Combined yeah, Authority. Second, Finally to say, Lord Mayor, my thanks to all the team that worked so hard on the Combined Authority Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And all I can say is, Lord Mayor, is onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call upon Councillor Leader Tickers to reply? Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, I think one of the points that um, Bridget made is actually a really critical thing, and it's one certainly we've spent a long time at scrutiny looking at. That the re It's taken me two years to actually understand where, what's real in terms of announcements, overspend, and what actually is kind of a pipeline or a dream or a vision. And I think... One of the things that really does worry me at this point in time is in a post-truth age, it's really important that as politicians and in areas like scrutiny and within executive positions, we are very clear what is real and we don't actually add to the cloud of um, misadvice and misinformation. And certainly one of the key things that we've been working on is to get this kind of funding uh, tracker through. Um, what I would then finally want to reflect on is what Pete Fowler um, referenced is that, you know, what is great about scrutiny is you can actually come to cross-party agreements. Um, the sheer shock and horror at the lack of understanding about the need for social housing and the need to actually develop social housing in our region was something that united the committee as does the need to actually ensure we have a recovery that meets every needs of our community. I'm sorry Liz didn't have a chance to talk. She's been, uh, again, absolutely tenacious individual on uh, scrutiny, and she has my total respect, as do my other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. We will now vote on the recommendation. Those in favour? Please raise your hands. Those against? So, recommendation is carried. Thank you very much. As we are running late, so therefore we are reducing the break and we will come back at 4.50 p.m. 16.50. Hmm? I think tea and coffee is being served on the table, and so please remain on your table and have this break. So we have to leave or we can leave.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. The um, amendments to the Constitution that are in front of us this afternoon have been the subject of consultation across all of the three uh, main parties and also some further discussion at Council Business Management Committee. As set out in the report, I uh, touch on the areas of uh, the Member Code of Conduct. We're responding to amendments made by the LGA back in May of this year and they also insert an additional clause in relation to disorder at meetings. There are some changes around financial regulations allowing approval of applying for bids or grant funding with uh, any subsequent acceptance of such bids coming back to Cabinet. And it removes the internal trading operations because the practice of wooden dollars between various departments is being phased out. And then finally, there is some tidying up about membership of the uh, JNC panel. So as I say, this has been the subject of uh, widespread consultation. So I will uh, move the uh, motion in my name on today's order paper. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Is that segment? As there is no debate, so I call upon the leader to see in what to reply. Let's make up the delay. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Uh, I, I suspect there's been no comment on this because, as I said earlier, uh, it has been the subject of consultation across all three parties and uh, considerable debate at Council Business Management Committee. Thank you. Thank you. We will now vote on the motion. Those in favour? Those against? This is carried. Thank you. Now, agenda item 11, we will now receive a report of the Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care providing an update on suicide prevention. The time limit for this item is 45 minutes. I have a list of speakers on this item. Could I ask those who want to speak but are not on the list to raise their hands and I will call you if there is a time. I call upon, are there anybody? I call upon Councillor Pollard Hamilton to move the motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Today I stand to present the update of the Suicide Prevention Strategy. In January last year, the Suicide Prevention Strategy was pre presented to full council. Presented to the Chamber today, we have a report setting out the progress made and despite, despite the ongoing pandemic. I am pleased to say that this report is ongoing, but many of the actions are making good progress. This is a highly emotive subject and one which there has been um, a, a unanimous support across the Chamber. As sadly, we all wish we could do more to stop the tragedy end to a person's life. I know many of us in the chamber have had first-hand experience of losing someone we love to suicide or have come through those dark periods with love, with um, the love and support of family and friends. Can I just say a quote at this point? The person who completes suicide dies once. Those left behind die a thousand deaths. Trying to re relive those terrible moments and understand why. Suicide is a truly devastating, it's tru it truly has a devastating effect on families and friends and the local community. The question always asked is, could I have done any more to help the person who has passed? This is why it is vital that we do all we can to prevent people reaching such a level of despair. There are many factors alongside and including depression, mental illness, the influence of a person's decision to go through with suicide that could be chronic ill health, trauma, substance misuse and the death of a loved one the new um and that's just to name a few 
the tragic thing that many of those who consider suicide don't really want is to die. It is just a cry for help. Many people just don't know how to deal with the pain they are experiencing. The statistics are startling. Last year, there were 5,224 suicides registered in England and Wales. Three quarters of the registered suicide deaths were from men. And the highest groups from both men, male and female were between the ages of 45 to 49 years old. But men tend not to open up, whereas women, you put them in a group and you give them a cup of coffee and women will talk for far more. Thankfully, talking about mental health is now not such a social stigma. It is far more acceptable. We hear the royals and celebrities talking openly about their own challenges and battles. It is okay to say, no, I don't feel well, or I'm not feeling quite right. We need to encourage and foster more of these conversations. Our ambition in this city is to have the low, well, to have a zero suicide rate, but we do want the lowest rates in the core cities, but our aim is to get to zero, zero suicides. But I am pleased to see the progress that has been made, especially we've been working with a lot of partners, such as the Samaritans, Network, no, Network Rail, Aston Villa Foundation, and Forward Thinking Birmingham, and also many of our emerging communities, which has been vital. We continue to work on this uh, with the Su Suicide Alliance campaign because it is really important that people get the training that they need. And I would encourage any councillor in this room, if you want to go forward for training, we can always access it through public health, through the, de the, the correct departments. This pandemic has not been easy for any of us. It has increased social isolation, loneliness and mental health demand. But with the lack of face-to-face -face appointments with some of our health services, some issues have actually escalated. We all need to do what we can to reach out as fundamentally suicide is preventable. As it is Remembrance Day next week, I have been speaking to both Councillor Morell and Councillor Sharp, and I would like to highlight the ongoing work with our partners in supporting our veterans and armed services personnel to highlight and reduce the risk of suicide in that group. And I wanted to reference that the Armed Forces Covenant Group continues to meet on a quarterly basis, and I want all colleagues to support us in this area of work as we continue to go forward. Can I end by saying, I know Councillor Morell has put forward um, uh, an amendment to the motion. And to be honest, um, I'm actually happy to agree because what he says is actually right. Um, the pandemic has had a profound impact on mental health issues in this city. We still haven't seen what the absolute statistics will be with people now living with mental health. And I do think that it should be added to the work that we're doing on this report. So to end, when you do have the strength to walk through the darkness, reach for a hand because you never know when sometimes you're walking through, but sometimes if you actually look in the sand, there's four of you walking, but you only see two footprints. Sometimes when you see someone in trouble, just give them a hand. Thank you very much, and thank you, Lord thank Mayor. You. And you. I propose this report. Thank you. Is that seconded? Thank you. I have one amendment. I call upon Councillor Simon Moral to move the amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Simon Moral from uh, Frankly Great Park Ward in South Birmingham. Um, colleagues, it's always refreshing um, to be able to stand up here and 
leave politics at the door. Uh, and I think we can all agree this is one of those issues. Last night I went home and wrote a very long speech and I woke up this morning and ripped it up. And I've just wrote some notes actually that I want to go through because as you all know, this is very personal to me. Uh, I lost one of my friends to suicide. Um, it was my maiden speech in 2018, and my friend was, uh, he was a member of the Labour Party, and uh, we used to debate all the time about politics. And in a time when politics has got very, very toxic, um, he, remi he reminds me why I got into politics. And um, I actually, it was part of my election address when I got elected, was to campaign about young men in particular in society who were falling behind and, uh, and very much being ignored and I donated a sum of my council allowance to the charity campaign against living miserably uh, which was founded by a feminist um, so th this is nothing to do with so-called men's rights activism it's just about helping men open up about their experiences and we as a council voted unanimously on this and quite rightly so and one of the objections in 2018 from members was that we didn't want this strategy to be sitting on a shelf and I'm really, really grateful, Councillor Hamilton, that this has not been sitting on a shelf and a lot of work has gone into it. So I want to extend again my gratitude and thanks to you and to Dr Justin Varney for the work that you've been putting into this. Now, the reason we've obviously raised this amendment is COVID obviously has affected all of us. Uh, today we're here with masks again. And I don't know anybody that hasn't suffered with mental health during the struggle. And I think we've realised actually how valuable our parklands are, actually, frankly. And I think it's really important that we do uh, take another look at that. And I'm, I'm really happy with the uh, Zero Suicide um, Alliance, the Public Health Lunch. And I'm also happy to see uh, that in the report you do explicitly state about the issues affecting men um, and in particular veterans as well, which is also really important. I'm also pleased to see the government uh, stepping up. Uh, £2.3 billion is being invested in mental health services by 2023-2024. They're recruiting 1,000 extra mental health staff and uh, during COVID there's a mental health recovery fund of £500 million. However, I will admit I don't think that's anywhere near enough and I will always continue to badger the government for more funding for mental health. In fact, I'm going to announce today, you will remember in April, I said I was going to donate my pay rise to charity. I believe it's about £700. Uh, today, I'm going to announce that money will be going to the Samaritans helpline. That will be £700 net. So that is after tax. So I'm not phoning HR to get them to go first. I'm just going to go and give them a check of £700 from the councillor allowance. Um, now, I wrote some more notes here about purpose and ensuring that people have purpose in their lives because mental health is only one side of this coin. On the other side of the coin, we need to be encouraging that everybody in this city, uh, particularly uh, uh, our young people, have opportunity and can go out and have purpose in their life so that they get out of bed every, uh, every morning with some kind of purpose. And I wanted to talk a little bit about social, social psychology and how people can very often fall into groupthink. And um, in psychology, they call this de-individualization. It's like when uh, football hooligan gangs, for example, cause trouble in the streets. They're doing it because they're part of a collective. They're not doing it individually. And we often do this in politics. We often shout at one another based upon our group identity and we forget that actually there are people. And I want to stay, stay here today because we're leaving politics at the door, that the individual is sovereign. That is one of our British values. And while I may absolutely despise your politics, I hate your, I might hate your politics, I will always love the person. And some of the people in this chamber who I have had probably the, the, the most uh, confrontation with politically, I actually have the most respect for. And I want to extend an invitation to anybody in this room who is suffering mentally that my door will always be open. And I always appreciate mavericks. And talking about suicide awareness, mavericks are at great risk of suicide. To name a few, Chester Benefield, Keith Flint, Robin Williams, they, they were all mavericks in their field and they took their own life. And one of my favourite quotes from Robin Williams, actually, uh, was that he said, I used to think the worst thing in life was to be all alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to be surrounded by people who make you feel all alone. And there's so much truth in that because in psychology they call it the bystander effect. We might see people struggling and we keep walking. We just walk past them because we think it's somebody else's problem. 
It's all of our problem. Mental health affects absolutely everybody and everybody should have first aid training to spot the signs and to do something because you can't literally save a life. And um, I think that's really also potent to say in the light of uh, the death of Sir David Amos as well, um, that behind the, behind the pantomime of this political chamber, um, we are all human at the end of the day, and uh, we, we all do have emotions. And uh, I think that, uh, like w once again, I, I will extend my invitation out to anybody who wants to talk about their, their issues. And I will just finalise finalize by, by a quote that I said in my maiden speech. As the largest local authority in Europe, we should, we should have a zero tolerance uh, to suicide. We should aim to smash the stigma surrounding mental health and as the second city, become the gold standard for the rest of the country to follow. And I hope you all will join me in achieving that. Thank you. Thank you. Now we call upon Councillor Matt Banner to second the amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm just going to speak very briefly to second the, the amendment. I mean, the, the, um, the circumstances by which this piece of work came about, I think, is one of a, a good example of this chamber at its best. Uh, Simon referred to his, his maiden speech um, and, <clears throat> and the, the action that followed. And, and Paulette uh, really picked up the sort of challenge and made sure that she drove through uh, the actions of having a suicide strategy, which has progressed very well. Um, even in the circumstances that we have. Our amendment, which I'm glad uh, Paulette has, has, has accepted, simply recognises the fact that the, uh, the terms of engagement have changed a great deal since this strategy was written. We've, we've had a pandemic which has led to isolation for a great many people. And therefore, the sort of, um, if you like, the, the conditions under which uh, the potential for suicide can flourish have, 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 have grown quite significantly. And therefore, we have to be all the more alert to make sure that this strategy succeeds. And we have to be perhaps reviewing some of the, the assumptions we made when this was written. So having said that, looking at the, the, the progress report we've had today, we can see that there has been good progress, particularly in the circumstances um, of, of having so many, so much resources having be, to be deployed towards the pandemic. So that's certainly to be commended. There are a few points I, I want to make really to be helpful, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, it may sound like quibbling, but I think it's important. Um, we've got recommendations that are rated in terms of progress. Uh, we've got uh, three rated at two, meaning that there's been it's not achieved. Four where it's in progress, but we're not in a position to, to monitor anything yet. And five is fully implemented. And some of them, I, if you read the narrative, they don't seem to to really stack up very well. Um, I'm looking, say, at uh, recommendation 3.3, which is rated as a five. The narrative says, the work is ongoing, but progress has and continues to be made. Safer prescribing practices are in place to ensure there are no medical stockpiling. It, it doesn't really tell us actually whether any progress has been made or not. It's just someone saying, yes, that sounds good. Um, and a bit more concerning is one of the recommendations rated two, um, where the evidence of progress, it just says NS emailed on the 11th of the 6th, 2021, which is fine, I think, if it, for a sort of an internal report saying, have you chased progress on this and this? But for an external report, it does look a little bit like somebody's just trying to pass the buck on to someone else. I don't think it's the right way to present a report like this. If someone was emailed on, on the 18th, 11th of June asking what progress has been made for a report like this, I think when a report comes to full council, we should actually understand what progress has or hasn't been made, not that somebody was emailed. These are quibbles. I think, I think we've done well in the circumstances. We certainly all want to do better um, and understand that the terms of engagement have changed slightly. But I think that this strategy represents how this council can work very, very well when we all pull together and put party political differences aside. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Now we call upon Councillor Mariam John. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I want to get something straight from the start. Suicide is not an illness. It's not about age, disability, race, religion, or belief, or sex, sex or sexual orientation. It's not just those individuals with mental health needs that are at risk. It's about crisis. 
It's about the person at risk feeling totally hopeless and not being able to find their way out of a situation other than taking their own life. It's about the person at risk feeling totally hopeless. Suicide affects all walks of life and a huge ripple effect across the community and residents living in our city. When we lose a person to suicide, we lose one of our own. David Stocks, a suicide prevention community development worker at the Black Country Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust, has suffered from mental health problems that pushed him towards taking his own life almost a decade ago. I was suicidal, he is quoted as saying, and felt the world was better off without me. I just wanted to end the pain inside. These must be such common thoughts for anyone who finds themselves in this situation. David's advice for others who are struggling with mental health is to know that you are not alone and that many people struggle with their lives too. Despite the pain you may be going through, now that with, now that with help and support, you will come through it. Mental health phone lines run by NHS England have reported answering around 120,000 calls just this year. This could be caused from a person experiencing mental health crisis, family or friends who may be concerned about a loved one or professionals who may come across people experiencing mental ill health. However, there are many others whom the help comes too late. Suicide is not just a cry for help, and yet it is the biggest killer of under 50s in the UK. From the statistics published by the Office for National Statistics for 2020, males and females aged 45 to 49 had the highest age specific suicide rate with 24.1 male and 7.1 female deaths per 100,000 people as recorded in the 2020 figures. In the West Midlands, this equated to 10.7 deaths per 100,000 people. And we lose children to suicide every year too. Sobering figures, as I am sure you will agree. <clears throat> suicide does not discriminate with government figures, showing there were 5,224 suicides registered in England and Wales in 2020, which was slightly down by 467 deaths in the previous year. It is believed this, this de decrease is likely to be driven by two key factors, a decrease in male suicides at the start of the coronavirus pandemic, and delays in the death registrations and coroner's investigations because of the pandemic. In addition, there are many health professionals who warned about the coming to tsunami of mental health issues as a result of the pandemic, with a number of current NHS services stretched to breaking point. It is estimated every 90 minutes someone in the UK ends their own life with the most common method of suicide in England and Wales for both males and females continuing to be hanging, strangulation, suffocation, which accounted for 58.1% of all suicides in 2020. In fact, my close friend's son, who was a, only a teenager, took his own life with his school tie. He had everything to live for, his whole life ahead of him, yet no support, and must have felt this way was the only way to end his pain. Unfortunately, the pain still goes on for his family. Okay, um, then I'll just cut it short. Finally, I would like to say of this, suicide does not end by the, the chance of a life getting worse, but eliminates the possibility of it ever getting better. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The next speaker is Councillor Akhlaq Ahmad. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I rise to uh, present a suicide prevention update. Um, we welcome the good progress that is being made against the actions despite the ongoing pandemic. Uh, we express our condolences to the families of the 79 people uh, who have taken their own lives across Birmingham and Solihull in 2020. Three quarters of registered suicide uh, deaths in England and Wales are of men. We welcome the work being undertaken uh, at community venues such as job centres, youth centres, 
sports venues, barbers, music venues and pubs to raise awareness of mental health amongst men in Birmingham. What can we do as elected members to ensure that we are promoting the existing services to people in our communities and help to break down the barriers that prevent people from talking about their mental health? The mental health of our children and young people in a, are a significant concern for all of us. How can we as elected members support children and young people and help their parents or carers to access the help that they need. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And um, it's, uh, there's uh, some incredible speeches to be following um, at this point in the debate, so thank you to everyone that's already spoken. Um, I just wanted to welcome progress on this hugely important piece of work. Uh, we've had a really detailed update from Councillor Hamilton today on the actions that are being taken directly um, to prevent suicide. Uh, but I wanted to take just a moment to reflect on some of the things that we can do in the wider council. Because depression and suicidal thoughts can strike you for no reason at any time, but we know that it is far, far more likely to happen to you uh, when, as Matt Councillor Jan said, you are in a place of crisis in your life and when your life is sort of stresses, tragedy and disadvantage and when you have trauma from previous experiences. We know that we can do more to tackle collectively the things that lead to poor mental health and that lead to people falling into that place of crisis. Um, and, and that's just where I wanted to reflect, Lord Mayor, on some of the, the other actions that we can take outside of the direct strategy just to place in members' minds as we're, we're forming other policies and forming up, making other decisions. So I'm proud that as a council, we are a real living wage employer. Um, we pay our um, staff more than uh, the basic minimum wage, um, and that just helps take the edge off some of the the, um, the the financial hardship that a lot of people in our city face. But we need, as a council, to be spreading more jobs like that in the city, and that's why we're working with the Living Wage Foundation to drive up wages in Birmingham. I'm really proud that we're tackling air pollution. It's got a direct link to poor mental health. That's been proven around the world. But again, we need to do more on that um, to, to take that out of our air. I'm really proud of the support that we've provided to help people through the pandemic. Councillor Hamilton and earlier in a speech, Councillor Thompson outlined some of the things that we've done with families uh, to provide help at that really, really difficult time for them. Um, but there is more that we can do. Um, in the wider council, whether it's looking at the built environment, whether it's looking at you know the size of homes that we're building, whether it's looking at the transport systems that we're designing that can remove stresses on people's lives um, and can can lead to can um, help try and prevent um, some of the things some of the things that cause people to fall into crisis. The pre uh, preventing eviction panel um, that I know Councillor Thompson's pioneered in housing is a really good example of somewhere else in the council where we take action to, um, to prevent that crisis from happening to people. It's not badged as a suicide prevention measure, but working in a cross-disciplinary way to help people stay in their own homes uh, when you're facing that terrifying prospect of being evicted is actually something that long-term will have the effect of, um, of preventing uh, people from falling into that, that place. Our digital inclusion, inclusion strategy, uh, as Councillor Hamilton mentioned, is a key thing for connecting people and has been more than ever during the crisis. It's not badged as a suicide prevention measure because it has a 101 other reasons for being a good thing to do. But actually by connecting to people, to, to their loved ones, by giving them um, a ways to reach out to other people they may not have had before, actually it can have that effect of providing people that extra support during a crisis. I could go on and on. There are so many policies, but actually if we apply the principles of thinking about how we prevent people from falling into that space, if we really think about the effect that our policies are having on people, um, they may not directly link in an obvious way to this agenda, but they can really have that effect on other people's lives. I just wanted to plant that in people's minds uh, for all of the work that people do, be it on scrutiny committees, in your wards, um, on cabinet or wherever. 
um, and really think about the impact that our policy choices uh, as politicians have on people, wherever it might be, across the board. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, um, and I will pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. No, I call upon Councillor Pullard Hamilton to reply. Right, thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I start by saying, Councillor Morell, I have been humbled at your passion in this area. You've really not stopped. You know, you'd see me in the corridor and you'd say, where are we at with that, Paulette? You have really, really committed to something and you followed it through. And can I assure you today that you're right, mental health, and this is the words I always use, it is everybody's business. There are many reasons why people want to commit suicide, but one of the main reasons out there, mental health issues, they're in crisis, they don't know where to turn. So, Simon, Councillor Morell, thank you, because you have been a stalwart in this area and you've not given up. And I'm telling you, as long as I've got breath in my body, this piece of work will continue and I know that whoever follows me it will be the same. Also Councillor Matt Bennett, Matt you're right those silly mistakes shouldn't be happening and I will put my hand up to that perhaps it's pressure of work I don't know but you've raised some simple points but can I assure you they will be rectified. And Councillor Jan, you always speak passionately about this issue in this area and you do make some valid points and this is why it is so important that we continue to progress in this area because it really, you actually shone a light as to why we need to progress and I just want to thank you for that. Councillor Ahmed, Thank you. Thank you for highlighting all the different areas where work is going on at the moment, where people are doing different things. Because sometimes we stand up here and we talk, but it's when other councillors come up here and they make it quite human by saying what's happening where out there in the communities that they serve and Bridget thank you thank you for talking about the wider issues I know I sit on city board with yourself and this has been a major challenge for us around mental health issues how are we working to ensure that our staff feel well um, looked after, well supported, how the wider public, how we're working with the wider system. It is so important that we remember how these things join up so that we don't lose any members of staff, we don't lose local residents or anybody else when we could have done the help that they needed. This subject is key. I've promised to bring back reports regularly, and I promise I will continue to do that. Mental health, male suicide, female suicide, this city wants to get to zero, that we have no suicides, and we are committed to driving the figures down. But it's going to take all of us. It's going to take the wider community, us working together, to ensure that we can reach our goals. So on that count, thank you all for joining in with this debate. And thank you, Lord Mayor, for allowing me to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. We will now vote on the amendment proposed by Councillor Simon Moral and seconded by Councillor Matt Bennett. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. We will now vote on the motion as amended. Those in favour? Those against? This amendment motion is carried. Thank you very much. Now we move on to agenda item 12. The time for this item is 90 minutes, but the, as you know that there are two motions and five amendments. Could I take the first motion? 
Could I ask those of you who want to speak but are not on the list to raise their hands and I will call you if there is a time. Can I also ask that when you present the motion that you clearly state that I move the motion as set out in today's paper, I call upon Councillor Peter Fowler to move the motion of which he has given notice. Mask, Lord Mayor, and stuck on the glasses. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. I propose the motion put forward in my name. Birmingham has unfortunately become a tale of two cities. On the one hand, you have a city centre that has millions of pounds being poured into pet projects. You have a city centre that is reaping the rewards from the Commonwealth Games. And you have a city centre that is the sole focus of the Labour leader and the Cabinet. The amount of money that has been wasted here is astronomical, all in the name of vanity projects, and that all too often overspent and resulted in money being poured down the drain, or in one specific case, poured, pouring money down a fountain. On the other hand, you have communities like Harborne, Ascot, Kings Norton, Longbridge, West Heath and Wheelie Castle and Selly Oak that are all too often forgotten by Labour and this council. Lord Mayor, I know from the conversations I have had in Harborne of the impact that this Labour administration has had on businesses in the high street. All too often I am speaking to business owners who tell me that the City Council feels like an organisational beast, all too far away from them, dogged in red tape, with an interest only in what happens with the ring road. Whilst Conservative councillors are out talking to residents and helping them navigate barrier after barrier that Labour have put in their way. So what are Labour doing? Well, I can give you one example in Harborn. On the last day of the market, run by Skets, the Labour councillor launched a petition stating, we are petitioning Harborne Village Bid, Councillor Francis and landowners in Harborne to consult fully with the traders about the future of the market and to propose a viable business plan to ensure that the market can continue to trade on our high street in the future. I want to draw your attention to that particular line in that quote. We are petitioning Harborn Village Bid and Councillor Francis. Ladies and gentlemen, this seems odd to me. Why is a Labour councillor in Harborn petitioning herself to do something? <laughs> Councillors shouldn't ask for signatures to seek permission to talk and listen to businesses. As councillors, this is what we should be doing anyway. This is a prime example of how Labour allow things to get so bad they close down before doing anything that the message to the residents is clear. That while Labour is reactive, it is only Conservatives that are proactive. Instead of asking residents permission to go and talk to businesses, I've been out there on the high street talking to businesses about how we can bring a local market with local businesses to the local community in Harborn. But Lord Mayor, the example it just doesn't stop in Harborn. I know from speaking to my colleagues in Sutton Coalfield, for example, that the failure of this council is epidemic from north to south. My colleague, the councillor for Sutton Mere Green, has been contacted by a local barbers who have told him how the council didn't pay business grant supports handed down by this Conservative government who stepped up during the pandemic and now acknowledge that they should have paid them. But it's too late as they've sent the money back to the government. Let me repeat that. 
instead of doing all they can to hand money to the businesses who need it, it's, they've been too busy making it too difficult and then sending it back to the government. This is not an isolated case, Lord Mayor. My colleague, Councillor for Sutton Roughly, had this, exactly the same thing happen to him with a local travel agent in his ward. Lord Mayor, this is simply not good enough. Let me talk about what our motion seeks to put right. In a nutshell, it seeks to make the council and its leader stand up and take up to the task in hand and give businesses and our high street the support that they need. We know this will work because it has come from speaking to businesses up and down the city. It's not rocket science, Lord Mayor. In fact, Lord Mayor, our motion seeks to provide a local touch that will support and bolster the national measures that the Conservative Government set out last week in its budget. The budget last week provides support for thousands of Birmingham businesses and I particularly welcome the hospitality and retail sector being able to claim a business rate discount of up to 50%, a business tax cut worth almost £1.7 billion, sweeping reforms from our outdated alcohol duty system, introducing a new system that is simpler, fairer and healthier, as well as a permanently cutting cost of a pint by 3p. A theatre tax relief announcement that will provide a boost for our creative industries across the city as we welcome on our path to a recovery post-COVID. <coughs> Doubling the tax relief for museums and galleries until 2023, part of a tax relief culture worth almost a quarter of a billion pounds and boosting local centres and tourism, which all of Birmingham can, can benefit from. Lord Mayor, I know how important these measures are. I've spent a lifetime in the leisure industry working in venues up and down Birmingham. They are the lifeblood of communities that they sit in, provide local jobs for local people and bring a boost to the economy here in Birmingham. These venues are crying out for action from the Council. It is the responsibility of all 101, thank you, to hear and call on act. So I'm calling to all our colleagues to take the time uh, as a cross party and clear support to back all of Birmingham. The Conservatives are getting on with the job. And I want to use the words of Sir Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party, to the leader of the Council. Either get a grip or get out of the way and let us clear up the mess. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bridget John would like to raise a point of clarification. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. It's just a point of clarification on the business grant situation. So wherever we've been made aware of somebody who, for whatever reason, has slipped through the net, they have been paid out of the ARG grant. It's just nobody's made me aware. So if you want to, send it in. Uh, but we have been looking after businesses where that has happened, and we have been putting in place arrangements. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I second the motion put forward. The struggles of the, and challenges of the High Street were clear for all to see before the pandemic. And following the lockdown, these have only been exasperated. We know that the smaller, more local shopping centre plays an incredibly important role in communities across our city. During the pandemic, these shopping centres saw a 35% drop in their footfall. <clears throat> this would have felt seismic to small independent businesses. This is significant as it illustrates how important a role they play in our neighbourhoods. This further highlights another point, that if we give them the support they need, they can be even stronger in the future. The community stepped up during the pandemic, and it's time the council did the same. And it's disappointing to see that in the answers to the written questions, and I know a point has just been made, that the City Council has returned £54 million to the government in unspent grants. This should be in the bank accounts of these small businesses protecting jobs. We know that these local high streets need to, be, to thrive. They need to be clean, attractive and accessible, with safety being paramount. The Conservative group know this from holding roundtable discussions with hospitality leaders and local bid schemes. 
Their message was clear. Birmingham needs to be cleaner and the council aren't doing enough. These are all the points the council have a huge influence over. Investing in these areas will reap so many positives. The impact this will have on business, bringing in consumers, helping them to recover some of what was lost from the pandemic. Also allowing these businesses to reinvest in their own high streets, creating new jobs and new opportunities. Our motion wishes to move the council, fo council's focus towards high street business, not just in the city centre. With Christmas nearly here, this provides a welcome opportunity to, to recover from the struggles of the last 18 months and protect existing jobs. Therefore, we call upon the council to support local Christmas markets, allowing our city to showcase the best of local business and fund local Christmas displays on high streets and lead a Shop Local This Christmas campaign across the city to help bolster our smaller, much more local economies. The council have control over where to place these resources and this mo motion urges them to turn these investments from the city centre into the areas that need it most. And let's just look at what the council has spent money on. They have gone over budget on Centenary Square, overspending by a third, spending close to £25 million in Victoria Square. The council has spent all the money available on the Paradise Circus development for Phase 1, that they now need to ask for £50 million for Phase 2, and by the way it's currently looking, it seems the executive will probably have to ask for more money for Phase 3. This is not just lost money, this is lost opportunity. Imagine what the High Street could have done with just a fraction of this money. This Christmas is just a first step. For far too long, these areas have been left behind. Following the pandemic, we must adapt our city's economy to allow smaller pop-up businesses to take advantage of derelict shopping units. We must provide additional street cleaning crews in all local high streets to make them more attractive to investment, and most importantly, we must rebalance spending commitments to ensure that suburban areas do not lose out to the city centre. King Stanley Circle has seen many years of neglect. Graffiti, half collapsed buildings, and hardly any attempt to make improvements. This is the reality for business in the rest of Birmingham. But now the council have an opportunity to try and improve this. We want Birmingham to be the place for SMEs to thrive, and now is the time for the council to invest resources and energy in unlocking and unleashing this potential. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bridget Donald raised a point of clarification. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, it's just another point of factual accuracy. So for the vast majority of the business grant schemes where we have returned money to the government, as was stated, it is because the government has demanded it back and because we've been given it with really strict criteria as to who could get it, and we've exhausted that criteria within the city. And that is the case of the vast majority of the money that has been sent back to the government. We've written to them and asked if we could keep it. They said no. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I have three amendments which will be debated with the motion. The First Amendment, I call upon Councillor Rajar Hamer to move the First Amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I move the amendment in my name and seconded by Councillor Ward. I welcome the motion proposed by Councillor Fowler today. Healthy local centres are vital for the future prosperity of Birmingham and have been neglected by this council in favour of endless refreshes of the city centre. Now I'm all in favour of the city centre looking good, but there is a balance to be struck with the needs of our local centres and the sad truth is that they have been losing out badly. The purpose of our amendment is to build on the motion by adding greater freedom in the spend of the Celebrating Communities Fund to include spend on festivities in local shopping centres between now and the Games, including funding Christmas lights. It is the long-standing view of my group that more decision-taking should be devolved to local councils in this city, including the provision of a community chest fund and giving greater freedom in the way existing funding can be spent is one way of moving towards this. The centre loves to control everything and decide how every last penny is spent. But the simple fact is that the centre cannot know all the needs of each community and local centre in a city of 1.1 million residents, and it therefore needs to devolve more power and spending ability to those that do. And I note here that there is a considerable cross-party consensus that the devolution agenda has stalled badly in this city. 
I blame that fairly and squarely on the leadership of this council and I urge them to make it more of a priority for the future. With greater working from home likely to be a long-lasting legacy of the pandemic, there is a significant opportunity and need for attractive, vibrant local centres to serve those who now work nearby rather than in the city centre, either full-time or for part of the week. As a council, we should be responding to that need, yet we are doing far too little to do so at the moment. Instead, we see the bid movement under major threat, with ACOTS Green businesses having voted narrowly to end theirs. That should be a wake-up call to all local centres that those, um, that those that care about their future and those that care about their future prosperity. It is time for this council to do more. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. No. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In my own ward of Sheldon, Christmas lights along Coventry Road were once a regular feature. They were in the Council's budget and e e eagerly anticipated each year by local residents. Sometimes we would even have a well-known celebrity attend to switch them on. As finances grew tighter, the number of lights dwindled but still we looked forward to their arrival. When they were eventually cut from the city budget, we were for a few years able to fund them through the much-loved Community Chest scheme. Community Chest became a thing of the past under Labour, but in 2015 I was able to facilitate a joint initiative with the keen PCSO, Steve McGrath, and the Sheldon Community Church to bring Sheldon Christmas lights at the Radleys that year and the following year. In 2017, former councillor Sue Anderson collected donations from many, including a lot of the local businesses, to keep the Radleys lights glowing for a third year. The last time I looked, the lights were still in the trees, but there was no money in 2018 to fund Amy to safely switch them on. Last year and the year before, we had the benefit of some Section 106 money and a town centre manager for the Coventry Road shopping area. So we had lights there again, but this year, nothing. All citizens have had a lot to endure for the last 20 months. Let's resolve to bring a bit of Christmas cheer to the suburbs by second the amendment. Thank you. Now there is a second amendment that I call upon Councillor Gareth Moore to move the second amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I propose to um, I propose the amendment that has been set out in my name. Local centres are the beating heart of our communities, and it's vital that we, as the City Council, support them as best we can. But sadly, for too long they have been neglected and successive Labour leaders have focused far too much on the city centre. Our local centres have been left behind, struggling to compete with the changing nature of the retail market, particularly with the growth of online um, companies and deliveries, and this was emphasised particularly during lockdown and the coronavirus pandemic, where so many people were had to stay at home and instead had to rely on online to get access to goods. How can retail compete with the benefits that an online company can have without the overheads and the costs that are associated with running a retail shop? Now, perhaps that may have been understandable when Sir Albert was leader of this council. After all, his ward was Ladywood, which covered the city centre. But sadly, successive Labour leaders have followed in that blinkered approach and have forgotten the rest of Birmingham. Now, Lord Mayor, I may be biased, but Erdington is the best place in Birmingham. It's the third largest local centre, which attracts over a million visitors each year. Its residents have huge civic pride and an immense level of community spirit, and it is a joy to both support them and represent them. But Erdington is not without its problems, particularly its local centre, and there have been challenges with both street drinking and antisocial behaviour. And myself and Councillor Alden have worked hard over the years to tackle these problems. We were successful in getting a public space protection order, one of the first in Birmingham, I believe, as part of the new changes introduced, and that helped crack down on gatherings and street drinking. 
We also managed to secure a cumulative impact policy because at the time when that was introduced, Erdington had over 25 off licenses alone, and at that time it was the second highest number of licensing applications received after Ladywood, which of course is the city centre. Local centres need radical reform, fundamental transformation to bring them into the 21st century, and Erdington is no different in that, because the fact is, as I touched on, retail has changed, and we need to ensure that our local centres are able to survive and adapt to the changing nature of retail. Now, the Future High Streets Fund that was brought forward was a ho hopeful opportunity to achieve this. And I'm particularly grateful to all those who was involved in putting forward Erdington for that, particularly those council officers, Erdington Bid, of course, our local policing team, our West Midlands Mayor Andy Street, St Barnabas Church and Whitted Lodge Community Association and other stakeholders. Our future High Streets Fund would have brought back into use the old Erdington swimming baths, an architectural jewel in the heart of Erdington, which should never have been closed by this council, and transform it into an enterprise hub to create employment opportunities. It would have helped revamp our village green and give it the TLC that it needs and improve connectivity between the high street and our train centre. It would have helped redevelop St, um, Central Square, uh, a disused shopping centre in the heart of Erdington High Street, and help provide um, housing, but also a hospitality aspect to our high street, because it's become clear that we need a thriving hospitality and leisure to support thriving high streets. That's what those that are doing well have, and that's what we need to bring to Erdington, to bring restaurants and cafes and the like. It would have also opened up St Barnabas Church, another jewel in the heart of Erdington, which sadly has been blocked off by you know, developments in the 50s and 60s. It should be a key focal point of our high street, but sadly that is not the case as a result of the Poundland built next door, and we want to see that demolished and provide new public realm to open up the beauty that that church has to offer, as well as fix the graveyard, which has been neglected for far too long. Now, sadly, Lord Mayor, as a result of an error committed by the Council, that bid was unsuccessful. But we had another opportunity with the levelling up fund as announced by the Government, and we were particularly pleased that this Council put forward the Erdington High Streets, well, a revamp of the Future High Streets Fund for the Erdington constituencies bid. That was particularly welcome because, as I've touched on earlier, we need real transformation for our local centres, and Erdington desperately needs it. Now, sadly, whilst the Council was willing to put forward us for the levelling up fund, it was not willing to provide the match funding along with the other bids that it submitted for both Ladywood, Hodge Hill and Hall Green constituencies. Now, it's particularly disappointing that that much funding was not provided, as it became transparent as a result of the budget that came forward, that those three bids were successful and Erdington's was not. The only one that did not have match funding was unsuccessful. It's a real shame, because I'm pretty sure that had this Council shown its true commitment to Erdington, that we would have been successful. But of course, the residents of Erdington are used to being let down by this council, because it's not just the Future High Streets Fund there was a mistake on, and it's not just the levelling up funding that they weren't willing to provide match funding for. But again, I, I touch back to our PSPO and our cumulative impact policy, a PSPO which this council still has not renewed, despite the fact it lapsed in 2018. And we have a cumulative impact policy which this council has scrapped because it failed to consult at the appropriate time. And we now have a situation where off-licences can once again flood our high street and bring the street drinking menace, which I'm grateful for our chief executive coming a couple of weeks ago to see the problem firsthand. We need action to tackle local centres like Erdington. But Erdington is not unique, and I have no doubt that there are many other local centres across the city who are facing the same problems. Erdington's story is not alone, and we've got you know, problems in Sutton Coalfield, Norfield and Harborne, as some have touched on earlier. We also need to revamp our local centres to introduce more residential, and I think a key way of doing that is to introduce more extra care villages, because older people quite often are not able to travel far, so providing these on the high street itself is a real opportunity to provide a market which will shop close by and support key local centres, and I do hope that we have the opportunities as part of any future funding applications to deliver this on Erdington High Street, given the success that other extra care villages have had, including elsewhere in Erdington in Yorskut Village, but other parts of the city as well well, notably Longbridge too, another place very close to a local centre. I just want to wrap up, Lord Mayor, because I do hope that you know, whilst our funding bids so far have been successful for Erdington, that this council will show that it will put Erdington and other local centres first by putting forward Erdington as part of any future bids for the levelling up fund. And I do hope that the leader is paying attention. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I call upon Councillor Simon Moral to second the amendment.
Right then, back to the politics. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Simon Ralph from Franklin Great Park, uh, part of the Northfield constituency in South Birmingham. Um, I have a connection, born and bred in Northfield, I have a connection to every single ward in the constituency, in particular uh, the Northfield High Street. I got my ear pierced there as a teenager, it was the 90s, had a birthday party at the McDonald's, and the local WH Smith in the Grosvenor used to be my daycare centre as mum would drop me there while she went shopping while I read all the fun facts books at the back. Um, my best memory of Northfield High Street was when I negotiated with my dad um, who was, that's the middle class side of the family, uh, to give me, because he was always missing pocket money, uh, and we, it was three pounds a week, and I says, look, Dad, if you just give me all my pocket money for the next two years, I'll be able to afford a Nintendo GameCube. And I remember going into, uh, getting the bus into Northfield, going into Dixon's, getting my Nintendo GameCube when it was launched, going back to Turves Green, going into that block of flats in the urine stained lift, and going back home and opening up that box. Very, very fond memories indeed. However, Northfield, tragically, has been neglected. We now see empty shops. WH Smith is not there anymore. I'm not even sure if McDonald's do birthday parties anymore. In fact, I know the KFC is left. This is due to 27 years of neglect under a Labour Member of Parliament who, frankly, cared more about Palestine than he did about Northfield. In fact, the most interest Labour showed to Northfield was during the general election when they put propaganda signs all around the old shops about child poverty. Disgraceful. And thankfully, you didn't win. Gary Sambrock, since he has been elected, has been lobbying for change in the Norfolk constituency. And we're already seeing this with investments in the West Works at Longbridge. Again, neglected under Labour. When I started my business, I as a web developer uh, when I was 27, I went down to Sturchley, which was like a revolving door for new businesses. And Sturchley, I think, is leading an example, actually, of what we can do with our high streets. But the biggest objection I used to get as a web developer there was that, why do I need a website to attract customers from further afield when people can't park their cars? And that's another problem with Labour, this Labour Council, is they want to pedestrianise the Northfield High Street. But the biggest scandal of all is the levelling up fund. You've already heard that the Erdington High Street has been rejected for that levelling up fund. The levelling up fund that our government is providing to local authorities, we don't really get much decision power over that. And do you know what this Labour Council has prioritised with the levelling up fund? You know where I'm going, don't you, Ian? They're demolishing 47 years of motorsport greatness and history in this city by bulldozing Birmingham wheels and building warehouses on its instead. That money would be much better served at the local high streets. To show solidarity, I was down at Birmingham Wheels uh, on Sunday for their last ever event, and I spoke to some of the people there who have a lot of anger about what is happening. And Councillor Ward, when I last saw you, we mentioned about civic pride and the Commonwealth Games. And it was one area where I think, as a fellow Brummie, I absolutely agree with you. This Commonwealth Games is going to create civic pride for this city. But I don't know how you can sit there with a straight face and talk about civic pride when you're not even prepared to go and speak to the people at Birmingham Wheels and listen to the fantastic proposals that they have got, which would not just provide warehousing, but also consolidate the motorsports and urban sports facilities to create a, a, a world-renowned site in the heart of the Midlands, which wouldn't just um, benefit the city, but would actually be a great advert to all the people coming to our city next year during the Commonwealth Games. So I would strongly urge you to reconsider that position, get down to Birmingham Wheels, go and have a chat with them, and let's try and find a proper solution rather than using a level-up fund to level them down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I call upon Councillor Simon Suleiman to move the Third Amendment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Colleagues, one of Birmingham's greatest strengths is its diversity, and this is well represented in the high streets and parades across our city, from the independent shops of King's Heath to the curry houses of the Balti Triangle. Each of our high streets offers something a little different. 
What unites them is that they provide a vital service for local people, giving residents a place to shop, socialise, eat and work within a short distance of their home. Our high streets require support, not just at Christmas but all year round, and I'm proud that Birmingham City Council has set out its vision for our local centres in the urban centres framework, which is even more important in light of the COVID pandemic. One change that we have uh, seen in the last 18 months is that there has been a renewed sense of purpose and community awareness, uh, and Birmingham City Council has worked with partners across the city to build on, the, on this change of attitudes. Colleagues, we have seen that the German Christmas market is currently being built in our city centre, but this is far from the only show in town this Christmas. Across the city, the council is supporting and facilitating festive events over the next two months, working with business improvement districts to support initiatives in their areas. It is great to see um, footfall increasing again in our local centres, um, you know, such as Hall Green Parade in Hall Green North, and the bids are going to play a vital role in encouraging people to visit their local centres over Christmas, building on the post-lockdown campaigns um, that the council ran to encourage people back to the high streets. We know that we have, we have an important role to play, and that is why we've invested 7.2 million to clean up our city, which includes new crews responsible for pavement washing and graffiti removal, who are working hard to clean up our, clean up our high streets. Their work will not stop when Christmas has been gone. They, work, they will work all year around to make our high streets as welcoming as possible for local residents. I have regularly liaised with businesses in my ward throughout the pandemic and the feedback has overwhelmingly been positive. Um, they have welcomed the excellent way in which this Labour Council has delivered grants and supported them through this pandemic. And I'm proud of the work that Birmingham Council, the Birmingham City Council is doing across the city and I encourage all colleagues to vote for this amendment and send a clear message to businesses across the city that we are on their side and that we are doing all we can to support our high streets. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Now I call upon Councillor Ian Ward to second the Third Amendment. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. A good starting point when you're proposing a motion for debate, before you even put pen to paper, is to find out what the Council is already doing. And if Councillor Fowler had bothered to check, he would have discovered that the Council is already working very closely with BIDS and other partners to support high streets and other centres right across Birmingham. And just to make it clear, Lord Mayor, our high streets are for life, not just for Christmas. Of course, of course we do work with partners to support festive displays across the city with new displays planned for nine additional locations this year. So let me deal with the Lib Dem amendment. We cannot commit to reallocate underspends from the Celebrating Communities Fund at this stage in the process. And it's also not sustainable to use one-off funding for events that the public will clearly see want to carry on year after year after year. That's without even referencing why only Christmas, why not the Chinese New Year, why not Diwali, why not Eid, etc. Because this isn't just about Christmas. High streets need support throughout the year. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer had an opportunity in his budget to put forward a fairer scheme of taxation and give high streets the long-term support and investment that they need. The high street will never recover from the pandemic unless there is a level playing field between bricks and mortar and online retailers. But the government have dragged their heels on reforming business rates. The truth is, Lord Mayor, the Tories have failed to support our high streets up and down this country. Local centres, high streets and parades are places where communities shop, socialise, live and work. That is why the council works closely with bids and local centres all year round to fund events and promotional campaigns that support high streets across Birmingham. That work has taken on added significance over the last 18 months as businesses in our local centres have battled for their very survival. 
and it will continue long after the pandemic because the council recognises that high streets are social and economic engines that benefit the city and the wider city region. They're places that people call home and may increasingly be places that people work in rather than travel from for work. Lord Mayor, high streets are about people. We must not forget the people who work on our high streets. That is why I met with Usdor yesterday and I will be campaigning alongside them for people who work on high streets to ensure they are paid the living wage and are treated decently. Leveling up has to be about people and not just a meaningless slogan. Which brings me to the Conservative Amendment. I'm also disappointed that the Erdington levelling up bid was not successful. It's not true that it didn't have match funding. It had £43 million of match funding and it is not a criteria of levelling up fund bids that they have to have city council match. What we now need to do is wait to see the feedback from government on the Erdington bid. Then we can consider how best to rebid and we do want to rebid. But in, in advance of that feedback, we cannot support the Conservative Amendment. But we will work with MPs on round two bids, particularly in Sutton and Northfield. So, as the Labour Amendment makes clear, we'll continue our ongoing work to commission a review that will inform the future development and social, cultural and economic curation of Birmingham's local centres. And through the local centre strategy, we'll continue to invest in high streets right across Birmingham. But the truth is, Lord Mayor, that it's the government that is killing off Britain's high streets by allowing shops to be turned into low-quality flats. The motion is another demonstration of how out of touch the Tories are. Nationally, their government has allowed shortages and prices to get out of control. Gas bills are up, petrol costs are up, food costs are up, and locally, the Tories can't think beyond Christmas. Lord Mayor, I second yeah, the Labour Amendment. I think we, with three amendments, the main motion, we have already spent 44 minutes. So now I call upon Councillor Peter Fowler to reply because we haven't got time for debate on this motion. That was uh, a bit of a uh, lively debate. Didn't expect it to be. Uh, that's uh, severe, but can I first of all thank all the people who have made contributions to the motion put forward, myself and, and uh, Darius. Can I also thank uh, actually Councillor uh, Mike Ward, uh, Councillor Harmer for, for their amendment as well, and also the great words from uh, Gareth Moore and uh, on Erdington and how local wards have been left behind, and also from Councillor Simon Morel, yet again, talking his great words about levelling up funds. And uh, thank you, Simon, about uh, bringing up yet again the Birmingham wheels and how we said earlier on where the wheels want to work, where you can put the wheels and with industry uh, as well. Uh, the council does need to do more, ladies and gentlemen, in our localities. And can I just say, Councillor Ward, you're right. It is, it is not just about Christmas in the city centre, and it certainly isn't about Christmas in our locality wards as well. It is all year round. And if you'd have taken the time to have read my motion, you'd have seen it was a long-term plan, not just for Christmas. And there was 12 requests of only three for, for, for Christmas. So go back. Have a read of it, come back and respond, and just say, as we have said, yes, the city centre is good and important for the city, but there are a hundred and one of us councillors that work so damn hard in our wards, and what we want to bring is more and better situations, more prosperity in our wards, our localities. That is what the motion is all about. So do the right thing and help our wards. Thank you. We will now vote on the amendments proposed by Councillors Roger Hammer and seconded by Councillor Mike Ward. Are those in favour? 
Okay. Are those against? Motion is lost. Thank you. Then we move on to the second motion, amendment, sorry, second amendment, which was moved by Councillor Gareth Moore and seconded by Councillor Simon Moral. All those in favor? All those against? That is lost. Nice. Okay. We will now have a named votes, group leaders, whips, and secretaries. You have one minute to ensure that your group members are in the room. Then we will lock the room. <laughs> so. Should we start? I think let's start. Councillors, again, I will call out all the names of the members to ensure that their votes are recorded. And I will also repeat how a member has voted to ensure it's picked up on the uh, web streaming and to ensure it's properly recorded by my colleagues. Councillor Ahmed. That was against. Councillor Aklak, Councillor Aitken and Councillor Akhtar all have given apologies. Councillor Deirdre Alden. Four. That was four. Councillor Robert Alden. Four. That was four, if you didn't hear that. Um, <laughs> Councillor Ali. N no response. Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Atwal have both given apologies. Councillor Azim. Against. That's against. Councillor Barry. Apologies. apologies. Councillor Baz, abstain. that's abstain. Councillor Beecham, apologies. that's apologies. Councillor Bennett, four. that was four. Councillor Booth, against. that was against. Councillor Bohr, yes. that was against. Councillor Brennan, against. that was against. Councillor Bridal, yes. that was against. Councillor Brown, that was against. Councillor Chatfield? Yes. That was against. Councillor Chowdhury? Apologies. Apologies. Councillor Clancy? Four. That was four. Councillor Clements? Apologies. Councillor Cornish? Four. That was four. Councillor Cotton has given his apologies. Councillor Davis? Yes. That was against. Councillor Delaney, that was four. Councillor Donaldson, that was against. Councillor Dring, apologies, sorry, big one, yes. And Councillor Fazel has also given his apologies. Councillor Fowler, that was four. Councillor Francis has given her apologies. Councillor Freeman, that was four. Councillor Peter Griffiths has given apologies. Councillor Grinrod, I was against. Councillor Hamilton? Yeah. That was against. Councillor Harmer? Abstain. That was abstain. Councillor Harris? Yeah. That was abstain. Councillor Kath Hartley has given her apologies. Councillor Higgs? Four. That was four. Councillor Holovara? That was four. Councillor Hobbrook? Not here. No response. Councillor Hunt? Abstain. That was abstain. Councillor Mahmood Hussein? Yes. That was against. Councillor Sabrine Hussein has given her apologies. Councillor Huxtable? That was four. Councillor Idris? Yes. That was against. Councillor Iqbal is giving his apologies. Councillor Iroh? Okay. That was against. 
Councillor Islam? That was against. Councillor Jan? That was abstained. Councillor Marion Jenkins? Four. That was four. Councillor Kerry Jenkins has given her apologies, as has Councillor Johnson White. Councillor Josh Jones? Apologies. apologies. Councillor Bridget Jones? Against. That was against. Councillor Corsa? Against. That was against. Councillor Miriam Khan? Against. That was against. So it's uh, here Khan has given his apologies. Councillor Kuna? Against. That was against. Councillor Lal? Against. That was against. Councillor Mike Leddy has given his apologies. Councillor Bruce Lines? Four. That was four. Councillor John Lines? Apologies. Councillor Mary Locke? Yes. That was against. Councillor Mackey? Four. That was four. Councillor Mahmood? Yes. That was against. Councillor Malik? Yes. That was against. Councillor McCarthy? Yes. That was against. Councillor Sadiq Mir has given apologies. Councillor Moore? Four. That was four. Councillor Morrell? Four. That was four. Councillor Mosquito? Okay. That was against. Councillor O'Reilly? Apologies. Councillor O'Shea? Against. That was against. Councillor Pears? That was four. Councillor Pocock? That was against. Councillor Pritchard? No. Abstain. I think abstain. Abstain. Councillor Quinnett and Councillor Rashid have both given apologies. Councillor Rice? Yes. Against. Councillor Sandbrook? I think he's given apologies. Councillor Saddu? Four. That was four. Councillor Scott? Apologies. Apologies. Councillor Shah? Yes. That was against. Councillor Sharp? Councillor Sharp? No. Apologies. Councillor Spence? Yes. That was against. Councillor Stamford? Four. That was four. Councillor Storer? Four. That was four. Councillor Straker Wells? Yes. That was against. Councillor Suleiman? I was against. Councillor Thompson? I was against. Councillor Tilsley? I was abstained. Councillor Trickett? That was against. Councillor Ian Ward? I was against. Councillor Mike Ward? That was abstained. Councillor Webb? I'm giving apologies. Councillor Wood? That was four. Councillor Yip? He's given apologies. And Councillor Zaffer has given apologies. My colleagues will now just do the figures. Councillor Chowdhury, same. So just that's Councillor, my apologies, Councillor Chowdhury, abstain. For the second amendment, those who voted for the amendment 21, those who voted against 36, and those who abstained 9. So the amendment is lost.
Now we move on to the third amendment, which was proposed by Councillor Sema Salman and seconded by Councillor Ian Ward. Those in favor? Those against? That is carried. We will now vote on the motion as amended. Those in favor? Those against? Motion is carried as amended. Thank you. Now we move on to the second motion. Which has which has been proposed by Council Parties. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I start by moving the motion that stands in my name? The essence of this notice of motion is to improve the integrity and safety of the pavements in Birmingham. I've no doubt that all of us, particularly during election times, when we've been pounding the streets, have probably fallen over and tripped. It's an occupational hazard in being in politics. Your feet automatically find those bumps in the pavement uh, and those cracked pavements. One of the concerns is that whilst you're young, you probably bounce and you don't hurt yourself too much, a few grazes, but as you get older, unfortunately, you do start to take a pounding. And I have to tell you the number of residents in Sheldon that have had broken arms and worse, broken hips, fractured hips, and I've had to try and help them A, get the pavement sorted out and B, if there's any compensation to be had, help them with that. And the first bullet point of the motion draws attention to the problems that bad pavements have on residents, particularly um, antisocial parking, where people don't frankly give a toss and just park across pavements and force uh, mothers with push chairs to go into busy roads. It is a problem and we have to accept it. It also mentions disabled people and uh, thanks to uh, Councillor Phil Davis who made mention of my um, uh, operation, um, I've been walking around with crutches for two reasons. A, to support my fractured hip because I managed to undo the surgeon's good work and B, to make sure that people get out of my way and give me enough space. But I have recognised the difficulty that there has been in moving around in Birmingham with inconsiderate parking. Now our pavements, Lord Mayor, were built and designed with drop curbs, many of them, for Austin Sevens and Morris Miners. They weren't designed and they haven't got the substructure for Mercedes Benz and BMWs. And as a consequence of that, whenever cars and heavy vehicles go over the pavements, inevitably there is damage to them. And I fall back, perhaps, shouldn't have used that pun, I return to the issue of damaged pavements. 
I have been called out on numerous occasions in Sheldon to damage pavements where either there has been uh, block paving carried out in the frontage and um, heavy vehicles have had to cross the verge and the pavement to get to the garden to tear it up or skips have been delivered and again they've gone over the verge and gone over the pavement. Now these are seven tonne vehicles and inevitably they're doing damage to the pavement and creating danger to our residents. Now that verge and that pavement in planning terms would be called a ransom strip because it's in public ownership and yet you're getting to private property. And the problem is that if a skip is ordered and delivered and parked on the road or it's parked on the verge, there is a £30 fee to be paid. That's fine. I've got no problem with that. But I think we should have a £30 fee to park on private drives as well. Because you are crossing public property, the verge and the pavement, and in doing so, creating problems. Now, it's noticeable that in my original notice of motion, there are 11 bullet points. And it has been passed through transportation departments and the cabinet member. Some alterations have been made and were made to the original. But it's noticeable that if you look through, there's no problem in basically bullet points one to six because they are in the original uh, transport plan and they are reiterating points that are in the uh, transport plan. No antisocial parking, etc. Um, but when it comes to the real nuts and bolts of the notice of motion, there are amendments that frankly neuter the whole essence of the notice of motion and that is to make pavements in Birmingham safer for pedestrians. Right. I'll return, Lord Mayor, to the health issues. One broken hip in direct costs is £13,000 to the NHS and a, an injured person can expect to spend 20 days in hospital. That's an unnecessary cost. It's 1% of the NHS budget. Unnecessary if we start to protect our pavements. And what is worse, over 50s, one in three die within 12 months who've suffered a fractured hip. And it gets a bit worse for the over 70s. And I'll leave it at that. I've moved. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I second the motion put forward in the name of myself and Councillor Tilsley. Um, cars and pedestrians don't mix. We know that. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous, and Councillor Tilsley gave us some examples. Um, a friend of mine was killed outside a, a local school the other day, um, and I was pleased to hear the leader at least putting some focus onto school safety earlier today. But um, I think the council needs to step up in that area. So th this is another motion following the one on average speed cameras that the Lib Dems brought last month, highlighting some of the issues around road safety, which are multiple um, in, in our city. And I'm pleased that, the, again, the transport plan and the executive is seeking to get more powers 
from London and from the government on this. It always surprises me that MPs don't spend more time focusing on some of the issues which really bother their constituents and bringing private members' bills and such like around these issues around highways, because the law on highways is a mess. It's a mess that London can have powers uh, on these issues, but those powers are never rolled out or devolved to other places in spite of all the talk about devolution. So we agree on that. Um, and I hope that we will agree on our motion today. Now, cars and pedestrians don't mix. I just want to bring up one thing, because the leader had a go at me earlier about, I think he was particularly talking about the Perry Bar flyover demolition. Now, that Perry Bar flyover, what it did was lifted the traffic over the pedestrian area. The new junction we have there is creating massive conflict between extra traffic and extra pedestrians. It's horrendous. It is not pedestrians and cars mixing in any way friendly. I say that. Similarly, with bus lanes, I support bus lanes and cycle lanes, but when we put bus lanes in, we must ensure the rest of the road stays safe for pedestrians and the rest of the road prevents vehicles racing down the extra lanes that are, cr are created. So safety is a critical thing, and safety goes alongside many of our other objectives. One of the problems we have as a council, particularly at the moment, and we hear this theme today, is always putting the, mo always putting the problem back to somebody else, as opposed to looking at ourselves as a council and what this council can do better. Councillor Tilsey's particular thing about skips is an important example of that of an issue which gets, I was going to say gets parked, but that's a wrong phrase to use, um, an issue that, well it does get, gets parked, it gets diverted because it's too difficult to do even though the council could do it. Another example, in my ward a few years ago we had an issue with cars piling up uh, around a cul-de-sac, around the corner of a cul-de-sac. Agreed with the local highways engineer, we had a bit of funding as you know, agreed the solution, put some yellow lines on the corner. The answer came back, we don't do yellow lines on corners because that's a job for the police, because the police have powers to move the cars off the corners. Uh, well, we, we fought that, and we, we got the yellow lines on that corner, on that corner at least. Uh, legal flexibility around traffic restrictions would help everybody as well. But sometimes there is a resistance in the council to doing the little things that make a difference, which is why I think uh, uh, the impact on the disabled, the partially sighted, a survey found 32% of respondents with vision impairments were less willing to go out on their own because of pavement parking. 48% for wheelchair users. It does have a huge impact on people who are very vulnerable. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Uh, I propose to move the amendment submitted in my name. The Conservative amendment to the Lib Dem motion seeks to add value to their motion. We can see a lot of merit in it. As councillors, the majority of, of us, if not all of us, know which roads in our wards experience antisocial pavement parking, uh, and for pavement I also include grass verges. This is why this amendment specifies that local councillors and residents who hold the local knowledge should be trusted to identify um, which roads uh, are suitable for a ban on antisocial parking uh, or a ban on grass verge parking. We also know where the roads are not suitable for uh, numerous reasons for uh, such bans. And I, was, uh, I, was, uh, I, went, I don't normally agree with Councillor Trickett on, on much, but she talked earlier about the lived experience and the understanding of living in our communities. And this is exactly what this motion is designed to uh, achieve. And the Leader of the Council during oral questions earlier stated that Whitehall should not dictate as Whitehall does not know best. So I would say back that Lancaster Circus should not dictate because Lancaster, Lancaster Circus does not know which measures are most suitable to tackle anti-social payment and grass verge parking in our wards, as there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Local councillors and residents should be trusted to find the right solution or solutions to parking issues in their ward, or more specifically, bespoke solutions to the numerous parking issues in different parts of their ward. Now, I'm proud that the Conservative Lib Dem administration running the City Council between 2004 and 2012 devolved 
budgets for highway schemes to ward councillors, which included grass verge protection measures, winter grit bins there to protect the pavements as well, and street lighting being other such measures. Indeed, during this meeting, a resident has contacted me regarding the need for more grass verge protection measures. Anyway, the highways budget permitted councillors to come up with innovative solutions, such as the installation of grasscrete to create much needed parking while protecting the grass verges, such as allowing, where appropriate, parking on wide pavements, which included a designated safe transit lane for pedestrians and pushchairs and wheelchairs and double buggies, but which overall improved road safety, reduced congestion and made public transport more reliable in terms of journey time. Again, it's these bespoke solutions that we trust local councillors and local residents to come up with. And also, other, other such innovative schemes were the installation of double curbing or wooden uh, and metal trip railing to protect uh, the grass verges. And I'm also pleased, as Councillor Tilsley has mentioned, that to tackle the issue of skips on the pavement and grass verges, the Conservative Lib Dem administration introduced the skip permit scheme. Uh, as I say, that Councillor Tilsley referred to. As the Lib Dem motion highlights, action to tackle antisocial pavement and grass verge parking can be confusing with limited legal remedies available to tackle uh, nuisance parking. How many times have we as councillors heard residents say that when they complained about antisocial parking, that the City Council say it's a police matter and the police say it's a City Council matter? And indeed, Councillor John Hunt referred to that in his speech. There needs to be much better liaison between City Council officers and the local neighbourhood police teams to jointly tackle such issues. Now, the Birmingham Transport Plan correctly identifies the issue of anti-social parking on pavements and grass verges, but it's short on solutions. Now, unfortunately, Councillor Wazim Safar isn't here as the Cabinet Member for Transport and Environment, but I've suggested measures to him that would improve, the, um, would resolve this problem but not only solve the problem, but also improve the environment, such as the planting more street trees in our grass verges, which physically prevent people parking on these grass verges, such as the placing of flower planters, along with flowers, on pavements in our local centres. We talked about how important local centres were, which would stop vehicles physically driving along these pavements. And I wait to see if there's any funding for those. Can I also, in my last few moments, mention there needs to be better maintenance of our hedges, hedgerows, uh, which obstruct our pavements. Too many times I've been told by residents that they've been forced to walk along the carriageway. They cannot walk along the pavements because the hedges that the City Council should maintain aren't maintained properly and obstruct those pavements. And if we're going to encourage uh, use of payments. There also needs to be better street lighting uh, where the street lighting has not been upgraded with the new energy efficient and environmentally friendly LED lighting. Um, I move this amendment. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I second this amendment um, put forward by Councillor um, Huxtable. Um, and I second this amendment because I think it's a very important addition to the motion put forward by Councillor Tilsley and Hunt. And it would fully address um, the citywide issue of antisocial, inconsiderate, and at times dangerous issue we have um, in this city. Now, we're all well aware as councillors uh, of the issues around inconsiderate, dangerous parking on our footpaths and our grass verges. Grass verges. We're all aware of the destruction it does to our communities. Sometimes the destruction is that bad to our grass verges. Residents comment that it looks like something out of the sun. Now, apart from the environmental issues around this, um, there are, of course, the dangers caused by the damage to pedestrians, in particular disabled, as has been mentioned earlier, the elderly, but our very young as well. And we must not forget 
to visually impaired people as well. But there is also the risk with antisocial parking of obstruction of view to other motorists, and that's an, another important point that we must look at. But these issues do as well cause tensions among communities. And sometimes you have residents taking matters into their own hands by placing objects obstructions on the grass verges. They do go some way to remedy the problem, um, but of course this brings other issues into play. Now at present, local authorities have very little powers to address um, and crack down on this parking behaviour. And as a result of that, the council is, uh, the council is treating <coughs> the symptoms rather than the causes. And the way this has been treated is by, often more often than not, spending large sums of money, large sums of money which is better spent elsewhere, on various schemes, but with restrictions on resources. Um, more often than not, there is only um, small schemes put in place which do go a little way to resolving them, but more often than not, it moves the problem further down the road. So it's time for this council to move away from that tunnel vision, and I'm not talking about the I-38 tunnels, but as we heard earlier, um, the resistance by the City Council to address it needs to change. It's time to tackle this problem by lobbying the government in support of this default ban on antisocial, inconsiderate, dangerous parking. But importantly, there needs to be local knowledge to dictate where these schemes need to be put in place. That local, local knowledge needs to be used so that the, um, the blanket ban is not imposed in areas where it is not reasonable, proportionate to implement the ban. So I ask members to support this oh, amendment. Lines, you've got 30 seconds. Thank you. Take this opportunity to end this blight on our city. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I rise to table the Labour amendment to the Lib Liberal Democrat motion as set out in my name in today's papers. Antisocial and inconsiderate parking is a blight for many residents across our city, which impacts on everyday lives, journeys and quality of life for so many people. Such behaviour particularly affects the most vulnerable people in our society, including our elderly residents, residents with disabilities, wheelchair users and families needing to make trips to local shops, schools, leisure and medical facilities with prams or pushchairs. This issue is at its most severe in our inner city communities and those areas of the city where terraced housing is most prevalent. The roads and housing in these areas were designed well over 100 years ago in the day of the horse and cart rather than the day of multi-car owning households. I know from my own local experience as, councillor, as ward councillor for Allen Rock how antisocial and inconsiderate parking affects my residents and I get complaints on an almost daily basis setting out the difficulties it causes for people going about their normal daily lives. Also, as a young mum with three children, one aged two and two one-year-olds, Yes, I know, insane. I personally know how hard it is to push a single pushchair down the road for a short, sweet eight months where I was the mother of just one before the twins arrived, let alone now how difficult it is to push and manoeuvre a triple buggy around inconsiderate parking in many parts of our city. As the Liberal Democrat motion states, the Birmingham Transport Plan makes reference to antisocial parking on pavements or across drop curbs causing a serious hazard to pedestrians, especially those with sight loss, parents with pushchairs, wheelchair users, young children and people with disabilities. Reflecting on the overall policy principles of the Transport Plan approved at October Cabinet, it is important that good alternatives to journeys by private car are made available to residents with improved options where possible to walk, cycle and use public transport. 
Not only does this help with parking issues, but it also helps address the serious air quality and health inequalities being experienced by many residents across the city. To help address inconsiderate parking in our local areas, the Council has a number of tools available. Firstly, as part of our amendment, we encourage local members who are the detailed eyes on the ground with significant no local knowledge to identify streets within their wards where nuisance or antisocial parking behaviour takes place and report this to officers within the highways department for follow-up action, including enforcement where appropriate. We would also encourage our residents to do the same where parking over dropped curbs is concerned. This will allow our civil enforcement officers to take necessary enforcement action and support their regular patrols in this respect. As members are aware, the Council does not currently have the same powers as London available in terms of parking, whereby a blanket traffic regulation order can be put in place to address par pavement parking. The Conservative Government consulted upon giving other local authorities the same powers as London well over 12 months ago. The Council is still waiting for confirmation as to the outcome, including any timescales as to when these powers may be forthcoming. This delay is unacceptable to our residents and our communities, and I will ask the Cabinet Member for Transport and Environment to write to the Secretary of State for Transport to seek an urgent update on progress on timescales. I must also add that I welcome the support within the first part of the Conservative Amendment for a default ban on antisocial parking, and I urge them to lobby their government to do more on this issue. It is a positive step for a Conservative group that normally spends most of its time defending high-polluting motor vehicles and refusing to face up to the challenge of the impact of pollution on our communities. When it comes to, when it comes to the second part of their amendment, whilst there are no plans to close the A38 tunnels, if we move to a carbon-free transport system, we cannot rule out any options for the future. Therefore, we cannot support the Conservative amendment. I recommend that the Labour amendment is supported by colleagues today at, at today's meeting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. I rise to second the amendment proposed by my colleague, the elected member for Alam Rock Ward, Councillor Mariam Khan. Lord Mayor, all of us witness daily inconsiderate and dangerous parking on pavements, grass verges, and across dropped curbs. That's why I welcome the spirit of the motion proposed by Councillor Paul Tilsley and Councillor John Hunt and thank them for bringing this to full council. However, we feel that the motion needs subtle tweaking and amending to make it much more workable in the current environment, as my, my colleague, Councilor Mariam Khan, has alluded upon. Lord Mayor, I am pleased, however, that the issue of skips has been raised in the motion, as I do feel that we do need to do more as a council to monitor skips on public land. All skips should have safety lights and markings on or around the skip. This could include reflective markings, traffic cones, nighttime safety lamps, and the name and telephone number of the company should be clearly visible. Lord Mayor, unfortunately, this is not happening in all cases, and my own casework around skips has steadily increased over the last few months. In the last three weeks, I've dealt with three issues of skips in my ward, including a skip company that initially refused to pick up the skip on Madison Avenue, going so far as alleging that the customer himself had moved the skip from the driveway onto the grass verge. The skip was eventually taken, but has left a huge hole in the grass verge where it was placed. Lord Mayor had another issue with the skip company on Playsto Avenue, which kept refusing to pick it up despite several reminders from the customer. I'm pleased that after I intervened with some gentle persuasion, the skip was finally taken. Lord Mayor, the customers themselves should also adhere to the conditions of the skip company by not overloading the skip more than the height level permitted. If it is overloaded, the skip company are within their rights to refuse to take it or charge extra for doing so. If skips are overflowing, it attracts fly tipping and can lead to items being blown onto the streets. Again, this is something that the council will end up picking up. Lord Mayor, I firmly believe we should do more in monitoring skip companies so that they adhere to the legislation, their license conditions, and don't cause more costs to the council. Perhaps a register where customers are required to complete the registration of the skip on the highway and or on private property with the council. If skip companies are found to be in breach of their license conditions, more robust action should be taken against them with all actions being made available in the public domain so that customers themselves can carry out a Google review of skip companies. 
Lord, may it's not just skips that lit, sometimes litter our streets and can cause accidents, but builders, sandbags, pallets and blocks create a nuisance in our streets and can be dangerous. I've witnessed many times grass and weeds growing out of sandbags and that's how long the material has been left. I really do think that merchants themselves should be held more accountable. Again, if we name and shame them and if one or two of them are prosecuted for fly tipping, it would send a very strong message. Lord Mayor, I have long campaigned uh, to strengthen the power of local councils, similar to uh, the case in London. Under, as Councillor John Hunt said, under the Great London Council General Powers Act 1974, motorists cannot park on urban roads with their carvings and pavements, grass verges, or land between carriageways. There are some exemptions around loading, unloading, and where the police have consented to the local council. That's why, Lord Mayor, I was pleased that there was a national consultation carried out last year that gave three options to councils to deal with inconsiderate parking, from relying on existing TRO powers, permit local authorities with civil parking enforcement to enforce against obstruction of the highway, and the third option being a national pavement parking prohibition. I understand the City Council went for option two and we still await the results. Lord Mayor, I, like all of us in the Chamber, want to see more done to tackle inconsiderate parking, and I really do believe if the recommendations of the Transport Committee into pavement parking are supported, by those consulted, it will help immensely with the tackle and payment parking, which has led to the problems identified. And Lord Mayor, I would like to place on record my thanks also to Guide Dogs UK, who have been robust in making representations to both national government, regional government, and to local government uh, to prohibit illegal parking. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, whilst we wait for support from national as elected members, we should make full use of our minor highways measures and those who have uh, environmental housing funds for social housing land to raise curbs, to introduce restricted parking and install bollards to help prevent illegal and considerate parking. Lord Mayor, I second the amendment proposed by Councillor Mariam Khan and urge all members to do so. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think just like with the first motion, we overrun the time. So we haven't got the time for any further debate. I call upon Councillor Partis to reply. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, unity has broken out within the City Council as far as antisocial uh, parking is concerned. So that in itself is a triumph. I fear, however, that the parking problem is going to get worse, particularly on verges and pavements, with the advent of the increase of electric vehicles and the paucity of charging points and the inability of people who perhaps live uh, on, on terraced streets, not having the ability to run leads across the pavement. Um, and there have been one or two um, examples of that already. Um, can I, first of all, um, thank John Hunt, obviously, for his uh, support and his plea for us to get the same powers as London as far as parking is concerned. Um, I also welcome the support from Tim Huxtable and Bruce Lyons. Um, and the added value that perhaps uh, is contained in their amendment. Uh, we have to target antisocial uh, parking and we need to protect the grass verges one of the USPs that we have in Birmingham, and it came with the development um, of the suburbs in the 30s, were our grass verges and the trees that were on them. It made an enormous difference to the development of Birmingham, and I think it's something that we collectively should be proud of. But in that pride, we need to be proud of the state of our verges because as colleagues have said and I think it was Bruce uh, 
um, who said uh, some verges, particularly at the end of the winter, look as if they've been attacked uh, and relieved from the sun uh, because they're in such a state. And they never, ever recover without protracted work by contractors to bring them back into uh, use. Marion Khan, Councillor Marion Khan, thank you. One of the problems in, um, in the inner city areas, and I represented Aston for, um, for 14 years, uh, my grandmother lived in Wright Road, um, so I know the problem of, uh, of, of uh, multi-car uh, ownership within terraced houses. And it is a problem, um, but we need to tackle the problem. One of the, one of the rites of passage, unfortunately, is that when you get to 17 or 18, you want your own car, you want your own independence to show mum and dad that you are independent and as a consequence you buy a car and frankly you've got nowhere to put the damn thing and it's a problem that all um, societies are going through uh, particularly um, in, in built up areas um, inconsiderate parking is a constant problem and regular patrols I would welcome them because um, if I mention Linden School in, in, in Sheldon, um, frequently we get commercial vehicles parked all over the pavement and we can't get a patrol to come out to ticket them. It is a problem and we need to be more responsive uh, to, uh, to problems that are thrown up on a daily basis. Um, to Councillor Mahmood, thank you um, for recognising the damage that skips can make. One thing that I found out over the last few months is that uh, uh, in my absence for a few days, my wife decided to declutter while I wasn't able to... Um, no, wasn't sensible at all. While I wasn't there to stop, to, to stop this happening. The skip was ordered for two weeks. It was there for a month. And that proves to me that there ain't no shortage of skips. There's too many of them. And we need to start to enforcing some of the legislation as far as skips are concerned and safety. Please vote for the Lib Dem and Conservative Amendment. I'm sorry, I'd love to uh, have your support as far as the Labour uh, group are concerned, but you've negated and neutered the real substance of the notice of motion. Thank, Thank you. you, Lord Mayor. We will now move on to vote on the amendments proposed by Councillor Timothy Huxtable and seconded by Councillor Bruce Lyons. Are those in favour? Are those against? That is defeated. As we are going to have a named vote, group leaders, whips and secretaries are requested that they have got one minute to ensure that their members are in the room before the door is locked. Okay, we start. Councillors, again, I'll take a, a name roll call. Uh, same process as the previous count. <coughs> Councillor Ahmed. That was against. 
Councillor Aklak and Councillor Aiken and Councillor Akhtar have all given apologies. Councillor Deirdre Alden. Four. That was four. Councillor Robert Alden. Four. That was four. Councillor Tahir Ali has given apologies. Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Atwell have also given apologies. Councillor Azim. That was against. Councillor Barry is apologies. Councillor Baz. That was four. Councillor Beecham. Apologies, I'll pick up. It's apologies. Councillor Bennett. That was four. Councillor Booth. Yes. That was against. Councillor Bohr. Yes. That was against. Councillor Brennan. Yes. That was against. Councillor Bridal. Yes. That was against. Councillor Brown. Yes. That was against. Councillor Chatfield. Yes. Councillor. That was against. Councillor Chowdhury. Councillor Debbie Clancy, four. that was four. Councillor Liz Clements, I believe given apologies. Councillor Cornish, that was four. Councillor John Cotton has given apologies. Councillor Davis, against. that was against. Councillor Delaney, four. that was four. Councillor Donaldson, yes. that was against. Councillor Drink and Fazal have given apologies. Councillor Fowler, four. that was four. Councillor Jane Francis has given apologies. Councillor Freeman, four. that was four. Councillor Peter Griffiths has given apologies. Councillor Grinrod, yes. that was against. Councillor Hamilton, yes. that was against. Councillor Harmer, four. that was four. Councillor Harries, four. that was four. Councillor Kath Hartley has given apologies. Councillor Higgs, four. that was four. Councillor Olivara, Oh, that was four. Councillor Holbrook has given apologies. Councillor Hunt? Four. That was four. Councillor Mahmoud Hussein? Yeah. That was against. Councillor Sabreen Hussein has given apologies. Councillor Huxtable? That was four. Councillor Idris? Yes. That was against. Councillor Iqbal has given apologies. Councillor Iro? Yeah. That was against. Councillor Islam? That was against. Councillor Jan? Four. That was four. Councillor Marion Jenkins? Four. That was four. Councillor Kerry Jenkins has given apologies, as has Councillor Johnson White. Councillor Josh Jones has also got apologies. Councillor Bridget Jones? That was against. Councillor Causa? That was against. Councillor Khan? Marion Khan? That was against. Councillor Zahir Khan has given apologies. Councillor Kuna, that was against. Councillor Lal, that was against. Councillor Mike Leddy has given apologies. Councillor Bruce Lyons, that was four. Councillor John Lyons has got apologies. Councillor Locke, that was against. Councillor Mackey, that was four. Councillor Mahmood, that was against. Councillor Malik, that was against. Councillor McCarthy? That was against. Councillor Mir has given apologies. Councillor Moore? Four. That was four. Councillor Morrell? That was four. Councillor Mosquito? That was, that was against. Councillor Brett O'Reilly have apologies. Councillor O'Shea? Okay. That was against. Councillor Pears? Four. That was four. Councillor Pocock? That was against. Councillor Pritchard? I was abstained. Councillor Quinnan and Councillor Rashid have given apologies. Councillor Rice, yeah. that was against. Councillor Sandbrook have apologies. Councillor Sadu, yeah. that was four. Councillor Kath Scott, his apologies. Councillor Shah, yeah. that was against. Councillor Mike Sharp, we have apologies. Councillor Spence, yeah. that was against. Councillor Stamford, yeah. that was four. Councillor Storer, four. that was four. Councillor Straker Wells, yes. that was against. Councillor Sullivan, that was against. Councillor Thompson, yes. that was against. Councillor Tilsley, four. that was four. Councillor Trickett, yes. that was against. Councillor Ian Ward, yes. that was against. Councillor Mike Ward, four. that was four. Councillor Webb, apologies. Councillor Wood, four. 
That was four. Councillor Yip and Councillor Zaffer, we have apologies. So my colleagues will now just do the figures again. Amendment which was proposed by Tipti Axtable and uh, seconded by Councillor Bruce Lyon. We got 29 votes for it and 36 votes against it and one abstention. So therefore, the amendment is lost. Then we move on to the second amendment which was proposed by Councillor Mariam Khan and seconded by Councillor Majid Mahmood. All those in favor? All those against? That is carried. We will now vote on the motion as amended. Those in favor? Those against? Though, so, therefore, the amended motion is carried. Thank you very much. That concludes the business of today's meeting. Thank you for attending this meeting. Thank you very much.